Okay, and we are on. We are on YouTube, streaming on YouTube and uh, ready to start. Um, Emma, are you here? Yes? Okay, great. Um, so just, just a couple words, just to welcome everybody to the uh, same, uh, to the second day of the um, Indigenous Resistance in the Digital Age Conference. Uh, for those of you who were not, uh, not here yesterday, we had really an amazing first day with uh, Professor Bronwyn Carson giving the first lecture and then lots of wonderful uh, talks um, across the, the two panels that we had following her lecture. Um, so now uh, it is time to move and open the uh, second day of the conference. And uh, we have another incredible speaker. I just wanna say that I'm very honored to have her here um, as I'm also grateful to have Oriana Palushi here introducing uh, our second keynote. Um, Oriana Palushi is uh, president of the Italian Association for Canadian Studies, um, president also of the Center for Canadian Studies at Orientale, and professor of English language and translation. Um, she's going to introduce our uh, keynote and Malarok for today. Oriana, the floor is yours. Oriana, we cannot hear you. You have to. Today, I'm sorry. I'm generally good at these things. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for organizing this wonderful conference. Um, I know you've been working uh, on the topic uh, for a long time. It is a real honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Emma Larocque. Before starting, I want to say that Emma Larocque introduced me personally many years ago to the topics, to Indigenous studies, and I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful because she decolonized my mind. Thank you, Emma, very much. Uh, you changed my perspective and I'm very thankful for that. Emma Larocque is, uh, Dr. Emma Larocque is a scholar, author, poet, and a veteran professor at the Department of Native Studies, University of Manitoba. Her uh, prolific career includes many publications in areas of colonization, decolonization, Canadian historiography, races, violence against women and First Nations and Métis literatures and identities. Her poems are widely anthologized in prestigious collections and journals. She is frequently cited in a wide variety of venues and has lectured locally, nationally and internationally on resettler, indigenous or colonizer, colonized relations. Overcoming obstacles of marginally, marginalization and poverty, Dr. Larocque acquired a Bachelor of Arts in 1973, degree in English communication from Goshen College, Indiana, a Master of Arts 1976 in peace studies from the associated Mennonite seminaries Elhart, Indiana, for which she received a Rockefeller Fellowship and an MA in history 1980, as well as a doctorate in interdisciplinary studies in history slash English 1999 from the University of Manitoba. Her dissertation on Aboriginal resistance literature 1999, as I mentioned, was nominated for the Distinguished Dissertation Award by the University of Manitoba. A role model for Indigenous scholars and students, Dr. Larocque has been a significant, if not leading figure in the growth and development of Native studies as a teaching discipline and an intellectual field of study. Her work has focused on the deconstruction of colonial misinterpretations and on the advancements of an indigenous based critical resistance theory in scholarship and is one of the most recognized and respected native scholars all over the world, I would add. 
In 2005, Dr. LaRocque received the National Aboriginal Achievement Award. And in 2019, she received the Indigenous Excellence Trailblazer Award from the University of Manitoba. She is the author, among many studies, of uh, Defeathering the Indian, 1975, which I said changed all my views on, you know, I was very young then, thank you, <laughs> which is about stereotypes in the school system. And more recently, the author of When the Other is Me, Native Resistance Discourse, 1850-1999, published in 2010, which won the Alexander Kennedy Ishriter Award from the, for nonfiction. Laroque La is originally from a Cree-speaking and land-based Métis family and community from Northwestern Alberta. I think we, I could go on endlessly, but I'm very pleased to be here and I can't wait to listen to her speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. My goodness, that was generous. Mind you, half of it I wrote. <laughs> So have we met in person, Ariana? She forgot her mic is off. She's saying oh. no. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for that generous, very generous introduction. And um, I should say too, I was I was very young when I wrote Defeathering. So I've grown a little since. And I also want to thank Dr. Anna Mongebello. Did I say that right? That was perfect, Emma. Thank you. For uh, honoring me with this invitation. And I only wish it was in person. <laughs> I, only, I, I have long wanted to <laughs> yeah, know, me too. come to Tuscany, among other places. In Naples, of course. It's close to the ocean, right? It's close to the sea, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, here in uh, Manitoba, well, in Winnipeg, I should say, uh, there are more Italian restaurants than any other ethnic group. And so we just go from one market to another. <laughs> and uh, enjoy ourselves. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I'm awake. And I'm not sure how long this will take. Um, if it goes past an hour or so, maybe maybe flag me. Oriana will tell you. Oriana All will right. tell you. All right. So um, I'm going to start with um, reading from my book, When the Other is Me, uh, four narratives that I have in there about my experiences with colonial misrepresentation. And then I will briefly discuss um, cultural accomplishments uh, by in indigenous peoples of the Americas. And this I think will put into perspective that the contemporary use of digital technology as a resistance strategy is neither remarkable nor an aberration, that in fact, it is just a new way of doing things. The first narrative, Nigan narrative in Cree means first, Nigan. Get him, Daniel Boone, get him. My eyes were wide open my hands clutching the sides of my desk. I waited breathlessly as America's mythic frontiersman, Daniel Boone, with an iron cast frying pan in hand, stood ready to spring upon a hideously painted Indian, stealthily crawling into his boathouse. Then boing, and our grade four, mostly Métis classroom, burst into gleeful applause. The gallant frontiersman had got him. Of course, it was not my first and certainly not my last exposure to such imagery. We were well acquainted with the scene of the tomahawk swinging savage who took shrieking delight rushing upon wagon trains, 
and defenseless white women and children. Iso narrative, second narrative. <clears throat> when my brothers and I were in elementary school, by the way, we all, Métis, most Métis went to public schools. When we were in elementary school, we were required to draw Columbus's ship. I drew a large detailed picture of a multi-storied clipper, its tall white sails fluttering against the cerulean blue sky, the sky touching the deep blue sea. It must have been then that I had to memorize the famous ditty. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean deep in blue. I was a Northern Canadian pre-speaking Métis child with a political and cultural heritage that was contrary to the Columbus narrative. At the time, I of course had no knowledge of the ramifications behind Columbus's ship, but I was left with the distinct impression that he was some godlike hero who had done the universe an inestimable, not to mention irreversible favor by discovering the new world, as they put it. Nito narrative, third narrative. In Goshen College, Indiana, the showing of the BBC film series, Civilization, written and narrated by Kenneth Clark, was a campus-wide mandatory event. Clark begins by arguing that Roman Greco cultural accomplishments defined civilization against the powerful but impermanent achievements of African masks or wandering Viking ships. But what has stayed with me about this series is how Clark compared a surviving, quote, pitifully crude stone baptistry to a wigwam by saying, but at least this miserable construction is built to last. It just isn't, it, it isn't just a wigwam. Ewe narrative, fourth and final narrative. <clears throat> In the summer of 1976, and prior to enrolling in Canadian history at the University of Manitoba in grad studies, I had an occasion to visit a martyr shrine, and it is called that, in a place called Middletown, Ontario, the province next to Manitoba. From the outside, the martyr shrine looked like any Eastern Roman Catholic cathedral, stone built, large and reminiscent of edifices shown in Kenneth Clark's Civilization series, on the inside, it looked like a large version of the Catholic churches my parents and teachers had made us attend. Dark, echoing, and full of flickering candles. I really had no idea what the martyr shrine represented until my eyes adjusted to the darkness. <clears throat> there at the very front of the pews were looming life-sized wax museum figures. I slowly realized what they were, kneeling priests, angelically looking up, hands folded, praying for mercy, as open-mouthed, hideously painted, evil-eyed savages tower over them, about to bury hatchets in their skulls. Inside myself, I resolved to know the truth behind such soul-numbing presentations. Walked out of that structure. Well, actually, I was practically had to be carried out by my friends. I walked out of that structure with fire in my head. Consciousness was seeping in. Liberation resistance scholarship was in the making. Of course, <clears throat> Columbus or the Jesuits were but the beginning of an endless string of white heroes that filled the pages of my comics and my school textbooks. 
the explorers, the conquistadors, the missionaries, the fur traders, the pilgrims and Puritans, the Daniel Boones, the American cavalry, and the cowboys, and Canadian Confederation. They were all presented as great, and their greatness was related to the degree to which they killed, dehumanized, or de-Indianized Indians, as they were called now known as First Nation. It would put in motion the glorification of the white man. While whites could experience a vicarious greatness watching cowboys beat the Indians, no matter how ferocious and cunning, as it was often put, native audiences crouched onto their seats grateful for the theater's darkness. Similarly, in so many of Canada's signal places, native peoples have had to cringe within themselves, having to cope with the resettlers' heroic point of view. Noted that at every important juncture and place in my life or in my family or community's life, our worlds have been either deleted, belittled or decontextualized by an assortment of white North America's propaganda machines. I have not been impressed. Canada's archives, I have experienced Canada's archives, libraries, cathedrals, martyr shrines, museums, movies, forts, street names, and university hallways, all places which reflect Eurocentrism, as places of exile. Framing the narrative, which aim my vocation, not surprisingly. Creation has come from discovering the Columbus narrative for what it is, a self-serving white cultural myth which has been effectively transmitted from generation to generation because it is embedded and institutionalized by white North America's powerful educational systems and, and uh, popular culture. The other aspect of my liberation has come from the knowing that native peoples were not as they were imagined. I've always known within myself that there was absolutely no connection between the faceless images of the, sab of the savage presentation and the consummate humanity of my parents, brothers and sister, my nohkom, grandmother, my aunts and uncles, my nieces and nephews. It is this unsung humanity, as much as the vilification of indigenous peoples that compelled me to this vocation of research and resistance. It is important that we understand the workings of colonial machinations behind the fantastic heroification of the proverbial white man, especially as it has been legitimized in Western scholarship. One of my favorite poems is written by the late Serene Stump. And, and he was an indigenous person who died quite young, unfortunately. And he wrote a little collection called, There Is My People Sleeping. And uh, I'm going to read you just a, a very brief poem from that collection, which was published in the 1970s. I was mixing stars and sand in front of him, but he couldn't understand. I was keeping the lightning of the thunder in my purse just in front of him, but he couldn't understand. And I had been killed a thousand times right at his feet, but he hadn't understood. One of the key features to colonial justifications for dispossessing and oppressing 
indigenous peoples, especially, well, all over North America, but uh, stunningly in, in Central America, was that indigenous peoples were at the bottom of the human evolution, cultural evolution, at the bottom of the cultural evolution. As savages, and that Europeans were, as I put it, civilages. They were without government, without law, and without faith, and without cultures worth talking about. And so because of that, uh, most of us indigenous intellectuals and scholars uh, have been put in a position of, of being, I think um, the word is apologist, having to defend and explain and justify uh, our histories and cultures. And so just, I'm just gonna do a little bit of that. Generally, Western biased historians have done a great disservice to knowledge and of course, to indigenous peoples. In their classically colonial renderings of indigenous peoples as stone age primitives with no significant cultural accomplishments or civilization. The ideological but systemic paradigm of what I have come to call the sib sab dichotomy is still deeply entrenched in our educational and media and, and marketplace institutions. In fact, indigenous cultures of the Americas have produced enormous material and non-material aspects of culture. The most obvious examples of great material production comes from Central America, particularly from the Aztecs, Incas, and Mayans who developed city-states, built massive pyramids, along with other marvelous stone, adobe, and wooden structures. These peoples also developed mathematically precise calendars requiring astronomical knowledge and so forth. These are among, these are among other technical wonders requiring engineering feats modern society is still trying to figure out. Throughout the Americas, indigenous peoples developed a wealth of horticultural and agricultural skills, foods, products, and pharmaceutical and medicinal knowledge, a fascinating array of techniques, tools, and textiles. Various indigenous peoples also invented unique dwellings, efficient means of transportation, precise tools, and numerous other land-based technologies suited to their cultural needs. The Northern peoples who are often the ones uh, that I think the anthropologists have pointed to as less advanced, these peoples practiced perhaps the most effective resource management systems anywhere in the world all the forest or the prairies or the Arctic in such a way that humans thrived and ecology was sustained. On non-material levels, indigenous peoples have invented thousands of wondrous and cultivated languages and literatures and a great variety of political, economic, and religious systems. Societies also develop exacting protocols for justice, ceremony, and art, with emphasis on the dignity and freedom of the human spirit. And some, not all, but some native cultures develop gender balance systems and the Six Nations Confederacy in Ontario and parts of New York um, developed this amazing gender balance political system 
which they still had male leadership, but clan mothers chose the leaders. They also, indigenous peoples as a rule, believed in tolerance of difference. These are values that the world today sorely needs. So this quick list overview is but a glimpse into the original accomplishments of indigenous peoples, the original peoples of the Americas. Overview does not even include the acquisitions or the ingenious cultural adaptations after the arrivals of Columbus, the conquistadors, the Jesuits, the, cow, the Daniel Boones, the cowboys, fur traders, and confederations. Such a quick view is not complete without making the additional point that not only has the world borrowed or appropriated much from indigenous wealth, resources, and cultures, but that modern North and South America is built on indigenous roots. As anthropologist Jack Weatherford has put it so precisely, quoting, these ancient and often ignored roots still nourish our modern society, political life, economy, art, agriculture, language, and distinctly American modes of thought. Europeans and their more modern descendants, it has to be said, have indeed borrowed or divested much from indigenous peoples. In the last number of decades, considerable scholarly attention has finally been given to colonization and its effects on indigenous peoples. people's histories, languages, literatures, religions, worldviews, political systems, technologies, architecture, sciences, and the arts did not begin or even end with European arrivals. Amazingly, much has survived. To be sure, survival has not been universal or even in texture, but what has not survived in whole we have and continue to reinvent. As I have long argued, pre-Columbian indigenous peoples were dynamic and adaptive and have continued to be despite all the invasions and with it massive depopulation and dispossession. Of course, we are not who we were, but neither is Europe. It is not as though the world that Shakespeare lived in hundreds of years ago, inhabited by monsters, witches, and countless other religious beliefs and secular speculations that had no basis in observational truths, is the world of contemporary Europeans. Both indigenous and Western cultures, hence scholars, are confronted with the historical realities of continuance and discontinuance. <clears throat> but it is Western-based scholarship that has traditionally treated indigenous cultures as stagnant, primitive clay pots into which progressive varnished European cultures infuse their European miracle, as Blout has put it, through colonial diffusion. Such a view constantly measures indigenous change and difference solely from Western cultural tenets, which are assumed to be the hub of the human wheel out of which emanate all things progressive in culture and intellect. So what is it that has enabled indigenous peoples to survive as they have? In part, it has been a combination of resilience and resistance. As every archeological and anthropological evidence 
that indigenous peoples have always been open to new technologies. A cursory study of most everything in history shows how indigenous people, for example, receive new technologies. Take writing, for instance. <clears throat> indigenous peoples were very open to the techniques of writing. Of course, many indigenous peoples had their own communication systems. The, uh, the Mayans, Aztecs, and Incas had their own written systems. The, uh, it is, it is, but I have read that uh, in Canada, the Anishinaabe nation, the Ojibwe, um, were in the process of developing some kind of writing system. And um, the Six Nations people and, and the, the Southeast Native American peoples were also developing writing systems. <clears throat> In 18, I'm sorry about my, this is too early for my throat. Um, <laughs> um, in, for instance, in 1840s in Western Canada, various native nations, Cree, Métis, um, Anishinaabe, Dene, <clears throat> helped a couple of missionaries develop a writing system called the syllabics. And once that was developed, it just spread like wildfire throughout uh, northern, what is now northern Canada. And Native people taught each other. Mother and her sisters knew the syllabic system. And in fact, right into the 1970s, they were writing to each other in the syllabic system. And um, as soon as indigenous people learned to read and write, they used writing <coughs> as a platform for resistance. I have to say, of course, that indigenous people did not, you know, they were not standing by the seashore waiting for Europeans to bring baubles. That as soon as they knew that uh, they were not respected, that their lands were threatened, indigenous peoples, there's just record upon record that documents that indigenous peoples resisted as much as they could. And in the long run, um, and it was a long run, it took about 200 years actually before indigenous peoples in Canada uh, lost their balance of power. And of course, um, by the 1820s, there were um, what one scholar called a, a, a coterie of um, literate native men, as it turned out. And these men were product, products of missionary training. And Missionary Protestant missionaries uh, were eager to train native men to read and write because it was a way to spread uh, Christianity among native peoples. And so there were quite a number of outstanding converts to Christianity who did learn to read and write and who by the 1840s were publishing. And Every one of them, though committed to uh, being converted to Christianity and sometimes internalizing colonial uh, ideas, nonetheless, they championed indigenous people's rights. And, uh, and they wrote some uh, amazing things. And I think I do have time to read one, for example. George Copway, <clears throat> sorry, um, was the probably the first native man 
in North America to be published. And um, I believe his, his first publication was in 1847. But there were publications and uh, written documents by these native missionaries as early as the 1820s. But this one has always really struck me, uh, written by George Copway in 1850. And it gives you an idea of how poetic uh, they, they, they could be and also where, where their hearts were. Okay, he writes, I was born in nature's wide domain. The trees were all that sheltered my infant limbs. The blue heavens all that covered me. I am one of nature's children. I have always admired her. She shall be my glory. Her features, her robes, and the wreath of, about her brow, the seasons, her stately oaks in the evergreen, her hair, ringlets over the earth, all contribute to my enduring love for her. And wherever I see her, emotions of pleasure roll in my breast and swell and burst like waves on the shores of the ocean. It is thought great to be born in palaces, surrounded with wealth, but to be born in nature's wide domain is greater still. And by the way, these men had been to Europe. They were often taken to Europe to, to try to uh, generate funding for their missions. And, uh, and very often they mesmerized Europeans. And they also wrote some really hilarious resistance, um, resistance material. I think I have time to read just one little, if I can find it. <clears throat> it's here somewhere. Just a, a paragraph from a, a, a fairly longish, uh, I don't know if this was a letter or a pamphlet, written by um, Peter Jones in 1831. This is one of the, he had been to Europe and this is uh, just one very ethnocentric comment I might add. The English are very fond of good living and many who live on roast beef, plum pudding and turtle soup got very fat and round as a toad. They eat four times in a day, breakfast at eight or nine, which consists of coffee or tea, bread and butter, and sometimes a little fried bacon, fish or eggs. Dinner at about two, <clears throat> which Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So they were what they were doing was um, I would call it returning returning the gaze. They already knew, and already there was a lots of literature available by colonizers, always taking this ethnographic approach to anything that native people did. And so these guys were very uh, keenly aware of that. So writing as a platform for resistance, very much in evidence. Oh, so, um, Europeans have no monopoly on change. All cultures change and, rein and people reinvent themselves. I will um, end by quoting a little bit from uh, When the Other is Me. Can we, nor should we, return to the past? that is to pre-Columbian nativism, any more than we should surrender to post-Columbian stereotypes. To acquiesce, to acquiesce to either of these colonial markers 
is to subordinate ourselves to the coloner's model of the world, as Blout put it. The doctrine that Europe's rise to world dominance is due to some internal and autonomous quality of race and culture, that the world derives its progress from the diffusion of European civilization. In other words, we cannot accept that human progress begins and ends with European culture because it does not. Franz Fanon argued for a new native, a native who had to find his or her way, a way that was neither, as he put it, neither tribal nor Western. Fanon was of course thinking of the inevitability of reinvention, of mobilizing human creativity. I believe we must reinvent ourselves, our country, our Americas, our world. By reinvention, I do not mean refabrication or myth-making. And as, it, as anyone who reads my material knows, I am no romanticist. I do not romanticize humans. But I mean, among other things, throwing off the weight of old stale ideas. And by doing so, offering new possibilities for reconstruction. Quite frankly, I think most of us, both European and indigenous peoples, were reinvented at the site of our encounters. And of course, Métis were invented at the site of indigenous and European encounters. Of course, each new generation is called to reinvent. First Nations and Métis writers and scholars have been reinventing and will continue to do so with each new generation. So digital technology is just another new thing that uh, the younger generation, I have to say not me, uh, is, is very well versed with social media and every other technical thing that goes on there. I don't, I, I, when I realized that this was a conference on digital uh, technology and resistance, I, I, I just about run away. I, I said to Anna, I really, honestly, I, know, I, I barely know how to email. So uh, here I find myself. So, uh, but I believe in reinvention, and I believe that humans have to reinvent. That is really the, the source of survival. And um, I think um, I have time to read one poem of mine, and I will end with that. <clears throat> and it's called Sweeping. I read the books. I saw the looks. I stooped to the downward sweep of Canada's eyelids, cast in lead, cast in redneck. But inside my head, I burst with dreams. In my belly, I roared. In my throat, I chanted. In the wombs of my mind, I made love with words and earth. In the beginning was the word, and the new story was the earth. And the new earth, was image nation. With sweet grass and sash, I swept up, I swept up the downwards. With sage and sass, I swallowed the leaded eyelids. Thank you very much. I can take questions. Thank, thank you very much uh, um, to Dr. Emma Larocque. Uh, this was just wonderful. It was a wonderful and stimulating overview of what it mean, it meant and what it means and what will mean to be Indigenous in Canada. Uh, you said you didn't speak of digital media, but you did. You did saying that uh, it already existed. They had other means of communication, which were for that period uh, let's say media uh, communication because the digital media is just a new way of communication. Thank you very much for 
underlining key concepts that tend to be seen as granted, but they are not still granted yet. There's still a lot of work to do. I, I appreciate it very much you starting with the white as great and greatness, how to not throw out old ideas. I would say to crush old ideas, to crush and put them away and finally decolonize the minds of those, not only whites of European cultures that thought they were superior. The whole concept of exhibiting the, uh, the indigenous people of Canada, and not only of Canada, of North America, of Australia, and so forth, as if they were not human, gave them the reason not to uh, think that they were intelligent, that they were writing. Thank you for that insert that in the 1820s they were writing. This has all been uh, obliterated, okay? So they've obliterated what they don't want because you can't say if people are literate and then they, they are not human. Uh, I must say that still nowadays, uh, there's a lot of work to be done. As, and as you said, a combination of, I'm quoting you, of resilience and resistance. And I'm sure that digital media will help the future generation to go on thanks to the work that you and other scholars have been doing. Because I believe that if uh, uh, an indigenous Amiti girl, as you were when you were young, uh, seeing that all the white girls were great and you weren't, uh, I mean, uh, was terrible. But I'm not saying that you have apologized. This is the last step. As you said, there's no apology. Let's look at the future and teach people how to look at other people. We are all the same. Thank you very much. It was inspiring. I have many questions, but I'll leave Anna and the um, questions to the students. Thank you very much indeed. I hope we will meet soon. <laughs> I've I've already I've already invited Emma to come over. Okay. okay. Uh, when, when, when... Emma, I'll invite you to task me if you come. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Emma, again, this was so powerful and and inspiring. And uh, as Oriana said, we really needed to uh, listen to you saying these things, uh, especially in a conference where we're dealing with digital technologies, because it all comes from what you've done as a scholar, as an activist as well, sure. uh, as an activist as well. Um, and also yesterday, uh, some of the speakers, but also uh, Professor Bronwyn Carson talked about um, resilience and resistance. Um, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, I was also thinking of this uh, concept of uh, uh, survivance that was uh, uh, theorized by uh, Wisner. Uh, was, I'm, I'm telling this to the students, who's an important scholar in indigenous studies, uh, the concept of surviving while resisting um, and how we can transfer that to the digital realm, uh, becoming a digital survivance in a way. Um, so thank you very much for saying so many important things and uh, for writing the things that you wrote, which were absolutely inspiring uh, also to me when thinking of uh, how uh, indigenous people uh, were um, resisting to and are still resisting to dominant representations uh, through many, across many different genres and, and using a variety of different tools, writing in the first place and now the digital uh, technologies. I think that's what's going on. Um, all right, I can see uh, some questions uh, from, the, from the audience. Uh, they are writing, um, uh, they're writing their questions in the, in the chat box. Um, so Oriana, do you want me to read the questions for Emma? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so first question uh, by Angela. Um, how um, have indigenous peoples 
try to defend their cultural identity and resist colonialism in the past and instead nowadays, how does technology contribute to it, I guess, to this process of resistance? Um, Emma, do you want me to, to read all the questions and then you, how um, do you want me to proceed? I'd probably like to, um, I, I will forget them, so I will answer as they come up. Okay, yes, go ahead. So this was the first question. Okay, so the first question, um, um, <laughs> so how do indigenous people defend their identity in the face of the pandemic? In the face of colonialism, um, how did that, um, how did, did they do that in the past? And how has it changed now with the new technologies in your opinion? Um, by continuing the ceremonies, mm -hmm. uh, the languages, mm -hmm. as much as they could. Um, some in Canada, some ceremonies were even uh, made illegal and uh, some indigenous people even went to jail for like the potlatch in the Northwest coast. Now that's another amazing uh, area of a great variety of amazing cultures there. Um, but they went underground. Many, most native people went underground. Uh, they continued with their ceremonies and and, uh, and and taught their children as much as they could. And of course, they didn't always succeed, especially when uh, the education system was imposed. Uh, for uh, First Nation people, the many uh, Aboriginal students were sent off to residential school. And I'm sure uh, you have heard that, uh, that you've seen the news right. of uh, how, how, how that is today. <laughs> it's coming back up. And uh, uh, I mean, just, it's just heartbreaking really. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in the 1970s, I was already discovering some of that information and I was teaching it in my classes at U of M and nobody would believe me. I mean, my, my student body was 99% white Canadian kids and they just talk about resistance. <laughs> they resisted this information because they had this view. Priests could not do anything like that. The police could never do anything like that. And you know, that stuff, but Anyway, how people survive. Well, you, you go underground when you have to. Mm -hmm. Also that oppression, even when it's horrible, uh, does not mean that, it, that people become amnesic with their culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there are many ways I think that people, people uh, sustain culture. It, you know, uh, my parents only spoke Cree. They never went to school, which, and in, which ca it can be said was a blessing for me because I grew up speaking only Cree and I didn't go to, I didn't start school until I was nine. And my parents, uh, they were very afraid for me to go to school. But my mom especially supported me to go to school. My dad didn't, he just, just did not. He just thought school was dangerous. And, and it was, but I didn't know that. I wanted to learn to read and write. So um, yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the human spirit, thank goodness, is rather amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I also wanted to jump in with a question, if you allow me, um, because I was curious to know your position with regard to the, the importance of indigenous languages and revitalization in practices, current practices of indigenous resistance. Oh, well, Cree is my sole language. And I very much want the younger generation to, to learn it if they don't know it. Mm -hmm. And the younger generation, I mean, we've lost 
I, I have to say we've lost a lot of indigenous languages. Uh, they haven't become extinct, but way less numbers of, of indigenous people are speaking their languages. But Cree remains uh, quite, the, a lot of people still speak Cree and the northern, the more northern peoples also still have their languages. And of course the Inuit uh, about whom I know very little, mm -hmm. uh, the peoples, the amazing peoples uh, from the Arctic, uh, they, they, they definitely have their language. Inuktitut, I, I yes. think. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so of course, I, 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 I support every effort to revive indigenous languages, including Michif, which yes. is actually uh, my language, only I didn't know that it, it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was, you know, because I, I, I grew up with all kinds of words. Um, in high school, I took French, and suddenly I went, holy mackerel, I know those words. So I went home and I told my parents, did you know that this was, and my dad said, well, of course. Sure. And I said, well, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> <laughs> Never asked, he said. So, uh, yeah. Okay. And, and, and yeah, there's, there are all kinds of, um, all kinds of ways that the younger generation are um, their cultures and learning and addressing and reinventing or reproducing uh, what was important to, to, to them, to their peoples. Emma, may I add that to answer the student, you give it for granted, but in the last 20, 30 years, there has been an increase in introduction of native studies in the different universities across Canada, as at the University of Manitoba, which was among the first, then in Saskatchewan, Vancouver, and so forth. I mean, there's also a higher level of education in native studies. You can get a degree and go on studying, which has changed, uh, which is a form of resistance in that, um, in, that, in that case as well. I mean, having higher education, you can't do it in a lower education, secondary school, high school, but you can always get a degree in uh, uh, native studies as where you are teaching at the University of Manitoba near Winnipeg. Um, yeah, actually this, the department of, uh, it is, it's going to change to indigenous studies much to my regret. Uh, I resist trendy things. <laughs> Whenever something becomes really popular, I kind of look at it sideways. But uh, in native studies, which I still prefer to call it. Okay. okay. When I when I first came to university as a grad student, it was in 1976, I think, and. I didn't even know there, a Native Studies department had just been formed. Okay. And, but because I already had written defeathering, the department, the brand new department head of this brand new thing, um, rec recognized me and asked me to teach. I had never taught in university. <laughs> I, I, so I was just one paragraph ahead of my students. And, but I fell in love with teaching and I basically kept that department going. And for a very long time, there were only three departments of native studies in Canada. And they all started in the late seventies. And, and only the last decade has there been newer uh, departments forming. Well, maybe, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And now there's uh, more and more and more across Canada the uh, ends. There's just a, a, a slew of fresh indigenous, uh, young fresh indigenous scholars coming out. And, and uh, I'm glad that they are 
forming more indigenous studies so they can get jobs. Uh, uh, of course, everybody is kind of waiting for me to retire so they can get my job. <laughs> to get jobs and spread and spread idea, the new ideas that we have crushed in the meantime. <laughs> in, our, in, in our classes now, oh, by the way, in our department, we offer uh, a P, uh, doctoral studies. You can get an MA and a PhD in, in uh, Indigenous studies. And talk about change. In the, in the late 70s, when I started teaching the the summers we had more native students, but in, in the regular terms, we had mostly white students, as I said. And um, now we have mostly native students, in native studies. I'm not, I, of course, I love that. I, I love that so many more indigenous kids have come to universities, but I also really want uh, white kids to take our courses sure. because, <laughs> You know, they, they, they need it as, as much as anybody. So um, I'm, I'm a little bit dismayed right now with how, that we're losing a lot of white kids. And if I, if I were me, if I were department head, which I never will be because I hate administration, um, that's what I would do is really, really try to get more white kids into our, into our programs. As you see, Emma, uh, we have a team here working on Indigenous studies. We've been working for some time and we've been going to Canada, trying to meet Indigenous people, try to participate in different activities and so on. Uh, I am very proud of my sash, my Métis sash. I'm sorry, just I didn't want to wear it today because I didn't want to be, too, you know, folklorist. I love my sash, so... So we're learning. We're learning. Okay, we are learning. And oh, I know there. Oh, I know there. There are a lot of there are a lot of allies yes. uh, in yes. Canada you and, can and bet growing. On that. You have a lot of allies, and I assure you that decolonizing the, the the minds of our young students is very difficult. But we are doing it. We have been doing it. So, I mean, I'm passing the, the message to Anna and Anna is going to carry on what I've been doing and I'm very proud of her, okay? Thank you, Oriana. And I forgot to mention that Oriana was my PhD supervisor and she's the one person that introduced me to Canada and Indigenous studies. So I'm, I'm very thankful um, for this reason too. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask one last question from the, the, the audience. Uh, there's a question about um, the effects of COVID-19 um, on to um, indigenous peoples. Uh, I'm just uh, summarizing the question. Um, what's, what's your experience and what can you tell us about um, the effects of, of COVID-19 on indigenous communities? Uh, well, I've been holed up in my home since March, 2020, and we are all teaching uh, virtually. And actually this has helped native students because they have been able to take courses virtually and they don't have to come to the cities. Um, my classes are plumb full. And so, um, and our intro class, which I no longer teach, uh, I taught it for 23 years. We have, um, on, in regular sessions, we have 200 to 250 students in these classes. We now are offering two sections, at least two sections that I know of. And uh, right now there are at least 400 students in the intro class, classes, two classes going on. And um, so there, there's a great interest. But the pandemic, yes, it's hitting, uh, unfortunately, it is hitting indigenous communities very hard, especially um, in northern, northern areas. I think less access to information, less access to health care, but that's a perpetual problem. It's just made worse with the pandemic. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see, though, that the, the government has made extra effort to, to vaccinate. Uh, it, but I, a lot of people are not really that 
I'm, I, I guess if you can't see it, you can't believe it, that it can be that bad. Um, so yeah, it's a struggle. It's a struggle. I think many, many people have died. Many people are suffering and most, the rest of us are afraid. Okay. Uh, okay, I, I think our time is up, Oriana, uh, Emma. So we have to end this uh, wonderful um, session. Uh, I would just like to thank again Oriana for presenting Emma and Emma Larocque, Dr. Emma Larocque for being here with us today. It was a real pleasure and, uh, as I said, real honor to have you here. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure and my honor, and I hope to meet you in person, uh, you both of you. Thank and uh, I do want to make it to, uh, to Italy. Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. Please do. Please do. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, Bye, and, yeah. and all the best for the rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now, uh, before moving on to the next panel, we're going to take a 10 minutes break. Uh, and uh, we will be back with... Uh, um, with uh, the uh, Indigenous Languages and Digital Revitalization uh, panel chaired by uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, Jackie Aiello from University of Ferrara. So 10 minutes break. Thanks everybody. Grazie, Anna. Grazie, Oriana, grazie. Grazie.
and we are back. Um, so if my dear friend Jackie is here, yes, I can see her. Good to see you. Good to see you, Jackie, and uh, and welcome. Um, so uh, Jackie, thank you for being here. I quickly introduce you, Jackie Ayello, Jacqueline Ayello, sorry, um, from universe. She's a, um, a senior tenure track researcher at the University of Ferrara in English language and uh, translation. Um, Jackie is chairing, uh, and I thank her very much, uh, the next panel on Indigenous languages and digital revitalization. Um, Jackie, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for the introduction and also for uh, inviting me to join this conference. It, it has an absolute honor. In fact, um, after a fascinating and truly moving plenary discussion, um, it is really a pleasure and an honor for me to chair this panel. I'd like to begin um, straight away by introducing the first talk of this session, Living Dictionaries, a Global Platform for Indigenous Language Documentation and Revitalization and its esteemed speakers. Uh, Ana Luisa De Nio is the Program Director of the Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages. A linguistic anthropologist, Quechua language learner and TEDx speaker, her articles about protecting the world's linguistic diversity have been published in the Dominion, Global Voices and Sapiens. See, she specializes in documenting the indigenous languages of the Americas and creating technological tools for language activists. The second speaker of this first talk is Gregory D.S. Anderson, who is the founder and president of the Living Tongues Institute for Endangered Languages. He has published numerous articles and books on endangered languages, language contact, linguistic typology, and historical linguistics. His areas of specialty include the Munda, Turkic, Native Siberian, Trans Himalayan, among countless others. Without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for having Thank you. us. It's wonderful to be here. I'll go ahead and um, share the screen. Okay, here we go. So yes, thank you very much the organizers and um, we're very pleased and honored to be able to share with you um, some work that we've been doing over the last few years uh, to try to help engage indigenous communities in their struggle to maintain their languages. Um, so the, the primary foundational philosophy behind this is the question of what if technology could forever change the way people operate in their daily lives. Technology is rightly considered disruptive, but what, it could, what if it could also disrupt language bias and privilege? What if access to certain language technologies could help language communities revitalize and to challenge language hier hierarchies and give those languages that are at risk a, a fighting chance for survival? So, well-known fact that over 3,000 languages appear to be in danger of, of being lost before 2100, so the time to act is now. Um, so the Living Dictionaries are a comprehensive free online tool integrating audio, images, and other multimedia that can assist these language communities and providing them a simple way to create high-quality multilingual documentation records. So this Living Dictionary platform is a progressive web application which functions within any internet browser, any computer or mobile device, whether Android or iOS or other. Living dictionaries can also be created, managed and edited using only the smartphones or tablets, which can function as complete workstations for recording, entering linguistic data and other multimedia. Living dictionaries can be public or private and may include written, diction, uh, written entries, excuse me, with translations and example sentences in multiple languages and scripts, as you can see here in this beer whore uh, screenshot. Audiovisual files, parts of speech in semantic domains, morphosyntactic linguistic analysis, and can be tagged with various types of metadata. So we run uh, various webinars as Living Tongues stands at the intersection of linguistics and activism. And we have the capacity to launch technological solutions to help aspiring language activists and scholars alike. By facilitating in-person and online workshops during which we train citizen linguists to record and edit words and phrases in their native languages, as one is shown here, we have developed a strong strategy that prioritizes documentation as well as professional empowerment. 
the Living Dictionaries platform is free because for almost all minority language communities, the costs relating to producing high quality linguistic materials can be insurmountable. At Living Tongues, we feel that it is a moral imperative in the 21st century uh, to engage in the decolonization and democratization of linguistic resources, as all the people at this panel well know. Online dictionaries should reflect their user communities, tailored to suit their needs, as well as be curated by citizen linguists. Community resources have greater uptake and engagement by communities if they take a primary role in developing them. So the old dictionary making paradigm was dependent on print restrictions, content limits, page layouts, alphabetization, and other issues related to cost and format. So corporate issues, so to speak. Today, powerful search functionality and the relatively low cost uh, of database storage has obviated many challenges of the past. We now benefit from the possibility of integrating audiovisual multimedia, the ability to accommodate sign as well as oral languages, and perhaps most importantly, the capacity to address the vast gap and digital resource availability that disproportionately impacts minority communities worldwide. A free multimedia online dictionary platform such as Living Dictionaries accommodates the needs of 21st century users using the latest technologies to produce tools that in the long run can become encyclopedic in nature. And we'll, we'll demonstrate some of this later. As activists in the field of endangered language documentation globally, we know that colonization has caused thousands of language communities to become disenfranchised. Most post-colonial nation states indeed are not investing in resources needed to support minority languages. Through the Living Dictionaries platform, Living Tongues Institute has approached solutions to the massive global language extinction crisis by attempting to obviate various institutionalized barriers that prevent equal status and equitable treatment of all forms of linguistic communication, training local people to conduct language documentation and revitalization work, and build dictionaries for their own communities as a core long-term aspect of our approach. Alas, most languages of the world remain resource impoverished. If a multilingual policy looks quasi-inclusive on paper, and many countries have such, there are typically a handful and maximally up to a dozen, say, regionally dominant languages of wider communication that are accommodated to varying degrees. But de facto, the goal is to transition these uh, communities to ever larger languages uh, and the more dominant languages in the local language hierarchies which is seen in among other areas by the narrowing of choices for the media of instruction as children advance through levels of schooling, where former colonial languages typically dominate higher levels and STEM disciplines, regardless of how many languages serve as media of instruction for entry level education. Combined with processes of elite closure and the state control of financial resources for educational, legal and media practices, the majority of minority languages remain outside of the economic mainstream. And indeed, their continued exclusion and disenfranchisement are typically justified by financial concerns. The Living Dictionaries platform obviates this institutionalized roadblock by being free for all to use. So the Living Dictionaries, uh, our digital dictionaries, can be created for any variety, whether it's oral or signed, recognized as a separate distinct language or just a dialect, patois, creole, pidgin, urban youth slang, or any other lectal designation. Ideologies of what is a proper linguistic variety uh, to be used in documentation or in a dictionary are, are completely, therefore, irrelevant to the living dictionaries. Living dictionaries can also accommodate as many dialects or variants as desired by the community members creating the tool. Decisions guiding what dialects are represented or which ones are not within a living dictionary are community driven. To be sure, grassroots efforts are indeed at the core of this work and communities deserve to be able to represent and, their, and access their languages and dialects online in the ways that work best for the speakers, the learners, and the stakeholders themselves. The materials and resources we create in collaboration with citizen linguists will become the driving force that help descendants revitalize their languages in the future. And I'll now give you some more details. The Living Dictionaries platform is a progressive web app that functions as a website in any desktop browser and behaves like a mobile app on smartphones and on tablets. Our platform does not require the user to download or install any software from the internet. Instead, Living Dictionaries cache data on the user's device itself. We're continuing to improve the offline mode capabilities to serve communities with limited internet connectivity around the world. This is a work in progress. The platform is programmed using HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and React.js with Svelte integration, and it uses Google Firebase on the backend as a cloud-hosted database. 
The code is stored in a GitHub repository, which is source available. Source available is similar to open source, but it has a non-commercial clause. We've made the setup process easy and user-friendly and fast so that citizen linguists can get started in building their living dictionaries with no institutional red tape. The first step is to create an account, then you can create a dictionary and populate it with the basic metadata that you see here. The name, the glossing languages, the coordinates on a map, alternate names, ISO code, glotto code, and whether you want your dictionary to be visible to the public or not. We also have a long list of glossing languages. Living dictionaries are multilingual resources and reference tools. Content in different glossing languages is searchable within the living dictionaries as well. Dictionary managers can choose from a list of over 300 different useful glossing languages that are worldwide in scope. We curated the list based on the dominant regional languages that users might need to make their glosses. And we'll continue to expand this list to include local languages in small scale multilingual situations around the world. People sometimes ask us about building monolingual dictionaries on the platform. Um, it's important to note that monolingual dictionaries can be made with some extra training from us and some extra time spent translating the interface into different languages. This is, a day, uh, this is an entry uh, for uh, the plural form of dogs in the Sora language from India. As you can see, for adding entries and multimedia into a living dictionary, this can be done on the platform by adding individual text entries and recording audio directly onto the platform. Here are the types of information that can be provided in a living dictionary. Uh, lexeme, phonetic transcription, representations in different orthographies. So here you see it, the same word represented in the Assamese script and in the Songpeng Mardir script, which, which is used by some of the indigenous SOAR communities. You also can have glosses into different languages. So this particular dictionary is very multilingual. It has glosses in Oriya, which is a, dom a regionally dominant language of India, and also Assamese and English. We also have space for the part of speech, semantic domain, morphology, interlinearization, and uh, dialect name, and some other uh, data as well. Here's another example of an entry from the Pokomchi language spoken in Guatemala. This was created by Maurilio Huptok and other collaborators. So as you can see, there's a range of different types of data that you can put into the living dictionary. And it's curated by the dictionary managers themselves and their teams. Um, it's also important to note that any entry can be shared on a living dictionary. You can share it uh, on social media, on WhatsApp, or uh, via text message or whatever you want. So it, it becomes a really good community resource tool. Um, other things can be shared too, like the whole dictionary itself, or even a unique URL um, that are gen unique URLs that are generated from every different uh, type of search query. Um, search results for a particular search query uh, or semantic domain um, are very powerful because it allows you to have, in this case, a bird's eye view into the ecological knowledge of the language. Um, this is an example from Gata, which is another language, um, uh, Munda language from India. So here you can see um, basically what we've activated here is one of the semantic domains filters. So all the entries in the living dictionary that are tagged as birds will then appear um, in this list, which you can see as list view, table view, and gallery view. So it becomes um, kind of an encyclopedic um, visual experience as well. We've also made the platform available in multiple interface languages. Um, the Living Dictionary website is currently available in English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Hebrew, Russian, Kiswahili, Bahasa Indonesia, Malay, and Bengali. We're also working with volunteer translators around the world um, to roll out the interface in Mandarin, Modern Standard Arabic, Filipino, Zulu, uh, Shona, Hindi, Assamese, and Oriya, and some other languages too that are coming out like next year. Here's an example of the Hizl Living Dictionary from Siberia as it is displayed in Russian. 
So this becomes very useful for people in Siberia who want to use this and don't want to use the interface in English, but want to browse and do everything in Russian. All the functionality and features, including extensive drop-down menus for semantic domains and parts of speech, are represented in the various different interface languages. Um, living dictionaries may be adjusted depending on what the data, uh, what different data the user wants to see. So for example, um, here the, you can see that a user can easily search for any morphemes that are embedded inside lexemes. So for example, the suffix pog in gata, which means bug, if you search for that suffix, um, you, can find, um, you can find all the words that have that. So it's not just dependent on what comes be at the beginning alphabetically of words. We can also uh, view the dictionaries in different ways. Um, so this is table view. So kind of like seeing it in a spreadsheet. This is gallery view. So as I mentioned before, seeing the images associated with this morpheme. And also here is a different uh, dictionary um, represented in list view. As an online platform that presently houses dictionaries for over 300 languages, it utilizes the safety and flexibility of remote collaboration between dictionary managers. The platform is engineered to have multiple collaborators logged into the system and editing a dictionary project at the same time in real time. Remote collaboration is therefore possible and encouraged on the platform. A dictionary manager can cre uh, create their dictionary and then invite other collaborators and managers to join. Here's an example of the Quechua del Sur Bolivia de Vacas Living Dictionary, which is being made in Bolivia. It's being worked on remotely by Noemi Condori Arias, Gabriel Gallinate, and several other Indigenous collaborators. Also, one of our top questions is batch imports from existing data. If the dictionary manager already has a large amount of text data in a spreadsheet like a CSV or in a doc file or something else, they can request a batch import spreadsheet template from our team by using a form that is found on our FAQ page. And the process of importing batch data is continually being improved. Um, so we're, we're actively working on improving how we can accommodate different formats. We've been working with a team of amazing scholars based in Zimbabwe to build the Kalanga Living Dictionary. And so this is an example, a little screenshot from the spreadsheet that was um, digital collaboration to, to then import onto the website. Um, we also have an integrated Algolia search integration. So that allows uh, users to search a living dictionary very efficiently, as well as use filters that can search by categories that I mentioned before, such as part of speech, semantic domain, speaker name, or other tags as well. Here you can see the Kalinago Living Dictionary, which we re recently launched in collaboration with Denise de Freitas and Hedy Osment, who are uh, Kalinago descendants. And here you can see um, the search filter for locations and directions. Uh, since they've been, doc the, the citizen linguists have been uh, documenting the original names of the islands um, in Kalinago. And so that becomes a really good way to understand the landscape and to uh, know about the different terms for the place names in this language. Uh, which was once spoken in the Caribbean region on St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Um, all of these details I mentioned today can be found on our comprehensive Frequently Asked Questions page, and that can be easily accessed through the link at the top of our website. So we update this on a weekly basis with new information and um, links to our Zoom webinars, which we do once every month, and we do a lot of one-on-ones as well. People can contact us as well anytime through the Contact Us button on our website. Um, and anytime, dictionary managers can also consult the Terms and Conditions page um, about intellectual property related to linguistic and cultural content, because it's very important that that intellectual property remains in the hands of the native speakers and the dictionary creators who work together to build the dictionaries on our platforms. Over to you, Greg. So in summary, uh, Living Tongues Institute has developed a practical web-based uh, web software, excuse me, that can help people build a dictionary from the ground up. Moving forward, our team will continue to build and refine this digital framework for global application and deploy the platform at scale to serve all the world's endangered languages, ideally. This project can help mitigate the global language 
extinction crisis by opening the door to linguistic documentation for all, expanding access to cultural equity and self-determination. We are committed to maintaining this platform for decades to come so that the work of language activists may live on and benefit community stakeholders, descendants, educators, and scholars. You can find more information about us uh, and the Living Dictionaries on our websites. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk and for providing information that convincingly elucidated this really noteworthy multilingual uh, and user-friendly resource. And also for your efforts to revitalize language and to disrupt, as you said, language bias and privilege. <clears throat> so thank you for that. Um, I, we will continue to the next speaker. We uh, have time at the end of the talks for questions. So we'll continue straight away to our next speakers, um, but please, um, we will have questions at the end. I see already that, speak, um, that there've been some questions. So we will ask those at the end in our Q&A session. So uh, moving on to our next speakers, which are um, Carrie Chu, uh, Mel Melvin calls him and Courtney Tunnell. Um, the, um, and I'll just proceed with an introduction of them. Yes, I, I can see them now. So Carrie A. A. B. Chu is a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation and assistant professor of indigenous education at the University of Oklahoma. She earned a doctorate in indigenous language education and linguistics from the University of Arizona and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Victoria. Her research focuses on indigenous language education and language curriculum. Melvin calls him as a PhD student studying adult and higher education in the Department of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of Oklahoma. Courtney Tunnell is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and a doctoral student in the, in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Oklahoma. She is a Razorback Sooner Scholar at the Zaro Center for Learning Enrichment. Her research focuses on indigenous special education and post-secondary transition. Their talk is entitled Relation, relationality in online indigenous, uh, yes, indigenous language learning. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, Koke. Okay. So thank you for having us to share our presentation about relationality in online indigenous language learning. I just loved hearing Dr. LaRoque's um, describing her ancestral language as her soul language. And so that's something that we think a lot about with this project, um, because that is, as Indigenous people, how we think about our languages as our soul languages. So the question that we are asking through our research is, how do Indigenous communities enact relationality in online Indigenous language courses? We will share our in-progress research. And I do mean in-progress. We just launched this project this fall, so we're, we're just beginning it. Um, but what we're, what we're aiming for is to advance scholarship and sharing practical strategies with Indigenous nations and organizations, as well as others who are working to support language revitalization through technology. So in the spirit of relationality, we wanted to begin by introducing ourselves to you um, in our own words. So um, I'll start by introducing myself in Chakashinumpa. Uh, which is the Chickasaw language. Chukma, Sohochifuit, Kari Chu, Chukasha Saya, Chukasha Iyagni Atali, University of Oklahoma, Akon, Atoksalili, Chukasha Nompa, Itanali. So what I what I said to you was, you know, greetings. I am a citizen of the Chickasaw Nation. Um, I am a Chickasaw language learner and I live in my nation. Um, in Ada, Oklahoma, and I also work for the University of Oklahoma. And I will pass it now to Melvin. Hi, uh, my name is uh, Melvin Kaltsim. I come from the uh, Ponca and Creek Nations of Oklahoma. Um, I'm a, a PhD student at the University of Oklahoma, as you all had mentioned earlier. And um, I'm also a research assistant too with Dr. Chu. So, uh, that's about it. I'll pass it to Courtney. Thank you. Osio Nakata, Courtney Tennell, Dakwadoa. Hello, everyone. My name is Courtney Tennell. I'm a Cherokee doctoral student here at OU, and my major is special education. Hey, Cookie. 
So we, we also want to, you know, center our own relationship to place. We're all calling in from a similar region. Um, and as we share where we're coming from, we invite you to also acknowledge where you are since we're all zooming in from different places in the world. So we gather on teach, learn, and engage with scholarship placed by its creator in the care and protection of the Caddo and Wichita peoples and originally shared by many indigenous nations, including the Kiowa, Comanche, Apache, and Osage as a place of gathering and exchange. Today, 39 tribal nations reside in what is currently known as Oklahoma, many as a result of settler colonial policies of removal that were designed to erase indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the University of Oklahoma's historical connection to indigenous peoples and its responsibility to the 39 sovereign tribal nations in the state. We acknowledge our connection to place and honor the land as relative. So we thought we'd begin by sharing what we think of when we think of relationality. And we wanna emphasize that there is no singular definition of relationality as indigenous peoples um, and epistemologies are not homogenous. So in our own thinking about relationality, we're guided by Mary Hermes, Megan Bang and Ananda Moren's idea that people are related to one another, the land, the spirits and to the language itself. For Walpria educator Barbara Martin, this means that people and languages are grounded in the landscape, yet indigenous languages were already placed on the landscape before any people came onto the scene. So we understand that with these relationships come responsibilities. Ganyet Gehaga scholar Amanda Holmes describes that relational consciousness and knowing emerge from within Ongwe Hongwe epistemologies of interconnectedness, engaging meanings of being a clear-minded human being, a relative. So if relationships between people, language, and land are inseparable, what happens when language learning moves online? So Cherokee course creator Bree Alexander tells us that online spaces can offer new possibilities for different types of connections. And at the same time, these spaces can create barriers to effective language learning and teaching. Anishinaabe scholar Jean-Paul Rastol explains that online place, relationships, and community building become virtual constructs and the norms of communication change. So our research brings together the fields of indigenous language revitalization or ILR and computer assisted language learning or CAL. ILR tends to prioritize in-person learning and teaching methods while CAL focuses on technology to support the learning and teaching of dominant languages. For example, English, French, and Spanish in North America. To create an online Indigenous language course, usually what happens is that Indigenous nations and organizations partner with a company or a nonprofit that specializes in this type of technology. And we want to note that there are currently no established and widely available platforms for online language courses that are designed with Indigenous communities and languages in mind. Some of the most popular platforms you might have heard of um, offering Indigenous language courses are Rosetta Stone, 7,000 Languages, and Duolingo. We'll hear a little bit more about this later in the presentation. Native Hawaiian scholar Candice Gala cautions us that technologies are often double -edged, a double-edged sword that have both potential to support language revitalization and to further contribute to colonization. Technology is the extension of the knowledge and belief system which has led to its creation. So that means that most technologies are designed to advance Western knowledge and beliefs. And when technologies do not align with and affirm indigenous ways of knowing and being, they can potentially function as yet another form of colonization that reinforces the Western-based dominant modes of knowledge systems and worldviews. As part of a relational epistemology, goals of connecting people to the land, to each other, and to the language 
may exist alongside and even take precedence over goals of advancing learners proficiency in the language. And so what we're really interested in is how do indigenous communities build these courses in ways that align with these goals, even when they're working on these mainstream Western controlled platforms. So I'm going to pass it over to Courtney, who will tell you a little bit about our methodology. Thank you. So we are an Indigenous research team, and we draw on Indigenous methodologies um, rooted in relational epistemologies to explore how Indigenous communities enact relationality in those online Indigenous language courses. Um, our research team began by compiling a list of Indigenous language computer assisted language learning courses. Uh, we looked for courses that were asynchronous and had a curriculum sequence. Um, because we're based in Oklahoma, we started our search here and we searched by nation, which was a little more work, but it allowed us to locate more grassroots and small scale efforts. As we worked out to the broader United States and to Canada and onto the world, we actually moved to searching by platform. So at this point in our research, we have identified 56 courses across uh, 14 platforms, and we're in the process of reviewing these courses. To share our database, we are developing an interactive map that shows where each courses community is situated. Um, it has links that go to the website so that you can access the course, uh, has the platform that the course is created on, the community, um, the, the organizations that produce the course. And right now we have the North American courses on it and we hope to have the rest of them on there soon. So um, we used our in-progress database to identify the courses we wanted to review or to review. We created a template to help us guide this process, to help us identify examples of relationality in video and images. So we're looking at, does the course use stock photos, um, branded images and videos, or do they use custom images and videos of the community? Um, we looked at the audio, is the audio of native speakers, are they identified? Do we know their relation to the language? We look at the vocabulary that's introduced, uh, what vocabulary is introduced? Um, is it introduced in a sequence that reflects cultural values in terms of like introductions, um, greetings? Um, we look at the direct grammatical instruction. Uh, we, we look for, do they explain the orthography decisions that were made to create the course? Um, assessment, how is the learning assessed in the, assessed in the course through checkpoints or quizzes? And then we look at other things like are there interactive community message boards, paid features, and things like that. All right, thank you, Courtney. So at this point, because this is in progress research, um, we thought that we'd sort of engage in a reflection on what we've learned so far in the form of a dialogue. So I'm gonna ask um, a few questions and then Courtney and Melvin will each answer based on what they've been finding in their, in their research. So Courtney, could you start by telling us which courses that you've looked at? Um, so far, I have reviewed Duolingo's Navajo and Hawaiian courses. The, LearnCherokee.org, which is hosted by Moodle, and the Mango Languages Cherokee course. And Melvin, which courses have you looked at? And so far, I've reviewed Duolingo as well, and the Mango Language uh, Hawaiian as well, too. So. And what were some of your initial impressions of the courses that you looked at? Um, we've looks at courses from like a wide range of budget options. So there are some that are free to users, um, created at low cost or no cost to the communities or organizations, some that are more of an investment for the community. And there's just a really wide range of budget options. And that's also true of the 
like the tech level expertise. Um, there are some that are relatively user-friendly and easy to create. And then there's some that require a more um, extensive background in computers or programming to create. And then another thing we've noticed is that some of the platforms have paid versions. And what we're trying to determine is whether the community receives proceeds from those subscriptions or licenses that are sold. And even on the free versions of apps, when ads pop up, if the communities receive proceeds from those ad sales or website clicks, and just trying to determine if the relationship between the community and the platform is more collaborative, like a partnership, or if it's more of an extractive model. Okay, and then some of the other initial impressions too was, um... Uh, money doesn't have much to do with with the ability to uh, you know center these cultural values in a course and um, as well as no platform is set up to center indigenous epistemologies and cultural values so it's up to the community to, th to think creative creatively about what is possible as there are many diverse epistemologies that uh, can uh, constitute uh, many uh, different platforms within this. So that's it. Yeah, cool, okay. And what examples of relationality did you see in the courses that you've reviewed? Um, we've seen courses that include um, language speakers by having audio and video that model community members speaking the language together. So where it's more like a dialogue between two native speakers. Um, we've seen that some platforms use like branded images and um, almost like cartoons. And then we see some platforms that made a real effort to have custom videos and custom photos of people in the community. And then as well, there. Um some that share cultural knowledge. Uh, some of the examples in the platforms uh, that share greetings, but not cultural context. Uh, others had notes to contextualize greetings too, as well in cultures, um, such as the, the typical intros, including the clans and et cetera. So that's it. Yeah, okay, thank you both for sharing your initial impressions um, and what you've learned so far. I will now pass it over to Melvin to share about where we see this project going as we move forward. Okay, so uh, future directions. Um, so we hope to create, you know, this open access resource, resource guidebook uh, that will be shared on Dr. Chu's uh, faculty website too as well. But this resource, resource guidebook will exemplify indigenous principles of relationality and provide notions and how communities will enact relationality while using common features of online language learning and platforms. So these notions can be implemented by indigenous communities and may also inform technology developers who are working to build platforms for language learning that encompass indigenous values. Uh, and we are also uh, planning on hosting a virtual half day gathering this coming spring semester so through the gathering, we will construct knowledge about how those who participate in online ILR uh, and understand and enact, and enact relationality in virtual spaces. So uh, the knowledge uh, uh, generated through these gatherings will, will be accessible to indigenous communities and academic audiences as well. And we will also be interviewing uh, people to get firsthand perspectives. So uh, the overall bigger picture, um, uh, we just hope that our research uh, contributes to the indigenous language re revitalization and reclamation movements, uh, both locally and globally. So that's it, thank you. Okay, so we, we hope that you'll be on the lookout for um, information about the gathering in the spring. Um, these are our sources, I'll pause here if anyone wants to take a screenshot. All right, and if you if you need anything from this slide, um, please reach out and we're happy to share. Thank you. Thank you so much for this enlightening talk on your ongoing research. 
we look forward to seeing how it develops. I just wanted to note, um, just anticipating our question and um, answer session, I particularly appreciated the problemization of the use of technology and particularly call in indigenous language revitalization, given its roots and creators in your study and, and the ways in which you're addressing it and attempting to do so and foreground, by foregrounding relationality. So I think that was particularly fascinating. So thank you for that. Um, again, we'll have a question and answer session at the end um, of the panel to which I look forward. So uh, we'll continue to the next speakers, um, which are Emre Bashak and Hamid Yuxel. I'll begin by introducing them. And um, so Emre um, Bashak is a PhD candidate in the Multilingual Language Education Program at the Ohio State University. His research interests lay in language ideologies, language policies, heritage language maintenance, by multilingualism, among others. He teaches advanced academic writing courses to international students at Ohio State University. Hamid Yuxel is a doctor of Circassian language and literature. His research interests are teaching Circassian Um, okay. the historical process and development part in the process, sorry, uh, in, the, in the project for the development of the West Caucasus language corpus at the University Higher School of Economics at Moscow as a consultant. I'm sorry, were you able to hear me or was there a problem with the connection? Yeah, yeah, we could hear you. Okay, sorry, because I didn't want to uh, compromise the uh, introduction of these speakers. Um, so without further ado, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, um, hi guys. Uh, I am talking about the role of online heritage language instruction in revitalization, a historically oppressed minority language in Turkey, the case of Sokation. After their tragic um, exodus from their indigenous homeland, Circassia to the Ottoman Empire, which some scholars call a systematic genocide, Sokation had to embrace Turkey as their ho new home in uh, 1864. According to my personal opinion, it's estimated that there is a, a Circassian population ranging from a minimum of 5.5 uh, million to a maximum of 20 million between. It can be said that uh, 10 million of them are in Turkey, 2.5 million in Circassian, and the remaining uh, uh, 7.5 million in countries, this uh, card and uh, the slide and countries that are not mentioned in this slide. Northwest Caucasian languages are spoken by around 2.5 million people, mainly in Abkhazia, the Kabardine Balkarian Republic and the Karacha Cherkes Republic and Adigeya. There are four or five main languages. Kabardian uh, is Circassian with uh, 1.6 million uh, speakers, Aduge or West Circassian with half a million speakers, Abhaz with uh, 190,000 speakers, Abaza with around uh, 50,000 speakers. The Circassian people consider both branches uh, to be the same language and refer to all varieties as Aduge Aduga, they are mutual intelligible. The Circassian language is uh, currently considered at risk by the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. By some estimates, fewer than 20% of the world's ethnic Circassians can speak the language and that number will likely decrease to 10% over the coming decades. While Circassian um, were settled in the Ottoman Empire, they were settled on a straight line from Sinop to Hatay and from the, there to the Golan Heights. A horseman has one day's travel distance between each settlement. Due to the geostrategic structure of the Ottoman Empire, at that time, the Circassian were settled as a barrier against threats from the east. When we take a historical look 
at the occasion in it, uh, two ways, promoting the preservation of the language in Turkey. We see the newspaper Waza. Waza was published in Circassian and Ottoman Turkish, which aimed to inform Circassian in Turkey, but it, it, but it also reached Syria, Jordan, and Caucasia, the, uh, where there was a concentrated Circassian population. Um, based on the freedom that emerged during the Tanzimat period, the Circassians were able to open two separate schools. One of them is Circassian Solidarity School, Cherkes Tawin Mektebi, and Circassian Sample School, Cherkes Örnek Okulu, which were very advanced compared to the Ottoman conditions at that time and provided education. Language ideologies policies after the declaration of the Republic in nine, uh, 1926. After the pro uh, proclamation of the Republic in 1926, language ideologies and policies towards the Circassians, who are considered among the non turkic Islamic elements, nation state ideologies, the, Turk, uh, the Turkification of ethnic and linguistic minorities, assimilationist language ideologies, and the citizen speak Turkish movement were put under pressure until the 1990s. And uh, Emre Vashok, going on. Yes. Emre Sesinaci. Huh, Emre Sesinaci. Open, huh? We cannot hear you. Can't hear you. No. How about now? Yes. Can, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Hamid, for uh, that nice introduction. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the Citizens Speak Turkish movement uh, and how it affected the Circassian uh, as a minority language in Turkey. So here on the right hand side, you see a newspaper script uh, from Jumhuriyet to the Republic newspaper. And you see how the language ideologies are reflected in the local newspapers back in the day during the uh, during 1920s and 30s. Uh, so the Citizens Speak Turkish movement was a linguistic uh, and cultural Turkification movement that the uh, Turkish uh, Republic uh, started based on nation state ideologies. Uh, and uh, it basically gained momentum uh, after uh, local com campaigns uh, and Turkish only uh, policies. Um, so with the COVID-19 pandemic, while the language has been oppressed for so long uh, in Turkey, uh, based on nation state ideologies and Turkification policies, there were several initiatives uh, to, um, to, to, to revitalize the Circassian language and the Circassian uh, associations in Turkey took the lead. And there were over 800 students who actually participated in these courses on different time, uh, time scales. And there's an ongoing uh, course uh, offered by Jean Tiamisha uh, based in Chicago. Uh, it's a TPR Zoom courses. So um, there are uh, several attempts now. So our study, we conducted this study uh, guided by ethno-linguistic identity theory. And basically we wanted to explore three research questions. What motivated participants to participate in the Zoom courses during the pandemic? And what was the perceived impact of these courses on students' heritage language proficiency? And finally, what was the impact of uh, these online Circassian language courses on participants' uh, ethnic uh, identity? So this study was a qualitative study, and we used Qualtrics surveys and semi-structured online interviews, and both the surveys and the interviews were conducted in Turkish, and 118 participants uh, aged uh, 18 to 65 joined our uh, took our sur uh, surveys uh, and we actually uh, recruited uh, participants who uh, attended these courses from Kayseri, Ankara and Shimali Caucasian associations for three to 12 months and we conducted 10 um, interviews with uh, some of the participants and all the data was analyzed uh, with the um, thematic content analysis for the purposes of this presentation I will uh, share our findings from the surveys. So the, here are the numbers from three different associations. Uh, we had more participants from Kayseri uh, Circassian Association. Uh, Kayseri is the town uh, that, that has more Circassian population than, uh, than others uh, in Turkey. 
And uh, the length of participants' attendance in these online courses uh, range from one to three months to nine to 12 months. And majority of our participants uh, participated in these online courses one to three months, but we had 15 participants who uh, attended these courses uh, up to a year. So our first research question was what motivated these participants to take online Circassian courses? Uh, and uh, as you see uh, here, participants, um, stated that the language, they regarded their uh, heritage language as the most important component of their culture, their heritage. And uh, one participant um, stated not knowing uh, their native language and they, they felt ashamed because of not knowing their um, native language. Uh, and they also shared that they wanted to gain more knowledge um, on their uh, heritage from original Circassian sources. Um, also, one participant stated they couldn't convince themselves of their existence without knowing their uh, mother tongue. But what interesting uh, uh, finding here was one of the survey respondents, he, um, he stated that this last uh, quote here, in 1976, this is after the military coup in Turkey in 1970s, unfortunately to get several uh, military coups that, uh, that oppressed uh, minorities and their language rights and uh, cultural rights and everything. But but in 1976, this participant attended a language course. Again, this is just a language course trying to teach uh, Circassians their heritage language, but the courses, was all, they were all shut down because they were uh, deemed illegal. So this, I thought this was interesting. So that now with online courses, participants are um, having some venue to learn their language and um, not, um, not, not feel uh, like doing something illegal. Uh, so our next uh, research question was on the, uh, the course's impact on their language proficiencies, and we, uh, we looked at uh, four domains, uh, but I, I must, uh, I must uh, tell uh, that this is just their perceived uh, proficiency. Since Circassian does not have a standardized language assessment that we could use to maybe compare their perceived language proficiencies with their actual language proficiency, so uh, since there is no test, we just... Uh, based this on their perceived language proficiencies. So before the courses, as you see here, a lot of uh, the participants, they could not read at all. And Circassian is mostly a spoken language in Turkey. Uh, and majority of uh, the Circassian population in Turkey, especially the older generation, they cannot read or write, but it's a, mostly a spoken language. So we see a nice improvement here after the courses uh, regarding uh, reading and also writing proficiency. While 74 of our participants could not write at all before the courses, that, uh, that also improved um, nicely after the courses. Uh, and listening comprehension, as I mentioned earlier, since it's a spoken language, our participants' listening comprehension was better compared to reading and writing. Uh, but uh, we saw a nice improvement uh, uh, in terms of listening comprehension uh, as well. So before the course as well, 23 of the participants could not understand uh, anything in Circassian. After the courses, that number dropped to only um, three. And uh, finally, participants uh, speaking. Uh, again, before the courses, uh, while 39 of our uh, 118 participants could not speak at all. After the courses, this number also dropped to 11 and uh, participants uh, improve their speaking uh, overall. So we also uh, asked our participants what, uh, what they did after the courses. The study was conducted after uh, the language courses uh, were uh, finished and Hamid was actually one of the instructors, uh, one of the language instructors. Uh, and we asked our participants um, if they uh, do any sort of language advocacy after the courses, right? This language has been oppressed in Turkey for so many years and the, this, uh, the, the, the COVID uh, pandemic actually created this, you know, opportunity for language resurgence and 53 of the participants, they said they strongly encourage others to learn their native language through online means uh, and 49 uh, of the participants, the over, overwhelming majority, they said they encourage uh, language learning. Um, so, and we asked them what they do for their uh, language advocacy efforts. Uh, and um, as you see here, participants, they shared uh, similar to what motivated them to take these courses. Uh, they shared that the courses helped them a lot uh, and 
they, they share the importance of protecting and preserving their uh, unique um, culture and language. Uh, and um, th they share that they're encouraging, especially the young people uh, for this language revitalization. Uh, and they share their concerns regarding the language becoming extinct if, uh, any, if, if no action is taken. And some participants actually shared their happiness that they, they experienced during these courses and they wanted others to experience this uh, happiness. They, they shared that as a reason for their language advocacy. Uh, and also um, um, <clears throat> to transfer the language, to transfer the language uh, to future generation. Uh, these were some of the reasons they shared for their advocacy efforts. Our last research question, uh, we looked at the course's impact uh, on participants' uh, ethnic identity, right? And we asked them if they felt that the courses actually impacted their um, sense of belonging to their ethnic identity. And uh, 62 participants out of 118, they said they strongly agreed that the courses positively affected their uh, belonging to their ethnic identity. Uh, and overwhelming majority, only one uh, participant stated they, they, they strongly disagreed with this uh, statement that, um, the courses impacted their ethnic identity. And our last uh, research question was uh, this um, ethnic identity. And here is the uh, findings, uh, some of the uh, open-ended responses from the surveys and uh, how the courses actually had positive impact on participants' ethnic identity. Um, and they, um, they again shared how uh, seeing how language is uh, closely related to their uh, ethnic identity. And one participant uh, actually shared that they felt more connected to their roots and to their family. And they're going to Nalchik. Uh, they said that they're going to Nalchik next month. Nalchik is the capital of kabardino balkaria Republic. It's one of the Circassian republics in the Russian Federation. That's uh, Circassians uh, call uh, the North Caucasus, uh, Nalchik is a homeland for this student, for instance. So they felt that uh, connection after the courses to their roots and they, they were uh, planning to visit their homeland. Uh, and also uh, one participant stated they were hesitant to tell people that they were Circassian before taking these courses because their language proficiency was not that, that great. And so after the courses, they, they, uh, they gained more confidence. And they uh, similarly, they shared uh, how the courses impacted their sense of belonging to their ethnicity uh, and how um, they, it changed their perspectives toward their uh, homeland, right? Um, so there was this disconnect between the people in diaspora countries and the homeland for so long uh, during, the, uh, um, during the Soviet uh, time. Uh, so it was like, like a really closed uh, um, community and Circassians in the Caucasus, they, they were not aware that there was this millions of people live in the diaspora countries and uh, Circassians in Turkey too, because they did not have really a connection, communication tools between, uh, to connect them. They were not really aware of uh, where, where Circassians are, which countries we live in. So um, recently for the next, uh, for the past, uh, maybe 10, 15 years, this connection has been uh, established. Uh, and one of our uh, participants uh, shared that um, it made, these courses uh, made them realize that Circassians um, haven't been assimilated yet and they, they got some hope for the future. Um, so so uh, par our participants also shared their efforts. Uh, we asked them, what do you do after these courses? Uh, are you doing anything uh, to improve your language proficiency? And a lot of our participants used uh, in Instagram. So Instagram has shared a lot and they shared what kind of, what were the pages that they used? Uh, uh, so they shared Instagram, Facebook, uh, YouTube, some web pages and Optolingo. Optolingo is a language app. It has, it's just like, it worked just like Duolingo. Uh, it has, uh, I think 20 or more languages. Uh, and the, uh, the creator of this app is John Tiamisha, a uh, native Circassian. And he actually has Circassian there for free. Uh, so any Circassian uh, learners who want to learn uh, Circassian, they can just go to this app and check it out. Participants also shared that besides online social media uh, sources. They actually use some, um, some uh, books that are written by the Circassian authors in the diaspora. So um, 
our discussion uh, then regarding our uh, three research questions, our participants saw language as one of the most important component of their uh, identity. That's why they joined these courses. And assimilation was one of the um, one of the um, threats that they, uh, they that they saw living um, in Turkey. And these courses, the participants were from all over the world. I joined myself for three months and there were participants from different countries. So with these courses, we actually were able to uh, get rid of that geographical uh, boundary, right? So everybody could participate from wherever they are uh, and participants uh, were motivated to, uh, to, to maintain and transfer their language. Uh, so for language proficiencies, all four domains of language uh, proficiency, they improved and uh, they, the courses played an important role in raising their awareness and also connection to their ethnic uh, identity, history uh, and uh, culture and participants um, uh, had started language advocacy efforts. Finally, some implications for policymakers and associations. For policymakers in Turkey, uh, acknowledging the linguistic diversity and uh, regarding heritage language as a linguistic human right, uh, not something uh, like separatist uh, or something illegal, uh, right? Um, unfortunately, there hasn't been much improvement in this regard and maybe offering these uh, Circassian language courses to K through 12 public school students uh, and some implications for uh, associations increasing the number of these online courses. Uh, over 800 people participated in these courses and they, they were extreme, extremely uh, helpful and beneficial for these students. So we need to continue these and maybe uh, do some teacher training programs for these Circassian language teachers so that they're aware of the second language acquisition theories and pedagogies and, and things like that. And maybe collaboration with the universities and uh, uh, other programs. Um, that's all I have. Thanks for listening. I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions you may have at the end. Thanks. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk on this, your study that analyzed um, your motivation, self-perceived um, proficiency changes, and also impacts of these online courses. I already have a few questions um, that I've written down as I was listening to your presentation, but as I said, I'll hold off until the Q&A session at the end. And I'm sure other participants have questions as well, and I'll leave the floor to them first. Sure, sounds good. Um, the, the speakers of the final talk of this panel are Rebecca Ingram and Kahente Horn Miller. Rebecca Ingram received her PhD from Carleton University. Her dissertation applied a new model and methodology to Ganyang Geha, please correct me, uh, my uh, pronunciation, please, place names. Presently, she continues this research at Carleton's Geomatics and Cartographic Research Center in collaboration with indigenous communities on the use of geospatial tools for documenting and revitalizing indigenous languages and indigenous knowledge. She's also the tribal linguist for the Catawba Nation of Rock Hill. Kahente Horn Miller is an associate professor in the School of Indigenous uh, of, of, in the School of Indigenous and the inaugural assistant vice president of Indigenous Initiatives. She co-chaired the Carleton University Strategic Indigenous Initiatives Committee and initiated, initiated the Indigenous Collaborative Learning Bundles Project, which is successfully increasing Indigenous content in classrooms across disciplines. Her research and teachings are centered in the development of hot, Haudenosaunee, I'm sorry, Haudenosaunee uh, specific research and pedagogical practices, indigenous methodologies, indigenous women, among others. Thank you very much. And please apologies for my pronunciation. I am learning. That's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, what we're gonna be talking about today are, is, a, is based on a project um, that we've been undertaking since, uh, I guess, since the be beginning of the lockdowns. And it stems from my colleague, Rebecca Ingram's original work um, as one of my grad students um, while she completed her doctoral thesis. Yes, uh, so first of all, Gahanta Yochatak, Skare Wakeni I Kanyakahaka Niwanjoto. Uh, I want to acknowledge that um, we are all, many of us are, are working and living in territories that are not our own, not of our own people. Um, I'm working in Algonquin unceded ter territory. I'm a Ganyakahaga, 
uh, from uh, my mother's from Gahnawage, my father is from Oswego or Six Nations. Uh, Rebecca, my colleague here, is also working in Anishinaabe, uh, unceded Algonquin territory. Um, so it's just, I think, important to acknowledge that we come from different places and we work in other nations' territories and uh, we are being good guests. Um, so today we're going to be talking a bit about um, Shirk funded Atlas of Ganyat Gahaga Space, which is um, a product of the, one of the Shirk grants. Uh, we'll give a brief overview of the project. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the ethics of working within the uh, communities that are involved, and then um, we'll discuss the outcomes of the research so far. So uh, we have been working together. As I mentioned, this stems from uh, Rebecca's original work, looking at Haudenosaunee Ganyakaha place names. Ganyakaha is another word for the Mohawk language. Um, as well, we have been working with community members from Taindanega, Aguazasne, Gahnawage, and um, uh, not yet from Six Nations, but a few from Ganasadaage. And so what they do is they make up the uh, Ganyakahaga Mapping Collective. Oops. Okay. Okay. So um, as Gahande mentioned, this is essentially an extension of um, some of my doctoral work for which Dr. Horn Miller was one of my advisors. Uh, centers historical and present day Ganyakeha place names and understanding of space in cooperation with members of the communities that um, we just discussed, Takwasazne, uh, Gafdege, and Gahnawage. Uh, this project provides evidence uh, regarding our theory of Onona, uh, in which language, culture, and landscape are connected, as shown in the figure here on your screen. As people were no longer able to use a space because of colonial encroachment, sometimes they forgot the original name, and as they forgot that name, they often also uh, forgot that space was embodied. Mm -hmm. So this project aims to document Ngangangeha place names together with landscape and environmental information using um, the Geomatics and Cartographic Research Center's Nunali Atlas platform with the goal of preserving the connections that are shown in the Onuna model. We use the iterative process of cyber cartography um, and the input of the name, uh, the input of all of the names together re reveals spatial patterns. And then we can focus those spatial patterns into themes. Um, this presentation focuses on the first iteration and the spatial patterns and the themes that have emerged from that work. Um, with, because we're working within Gehaga communities, we're using um, the Oha de Gaswenta, uh, otherwise known as the two row wampum, as the ethical framework as it provided an original template um, blueprint for relationships between um, Haudenosaunee people and non-Haudenosaunee people. It also follows um, ownership, control, access, and, pro and possession protocols, um, which are protocols that are being developed here in Canada. And it, this is in addition to the general um, Carlton, Carlton ethics clearance process. So because of COVID, our preliminary engagement with these communities took place via Zoom. Um, and then when it was safe to do so, we started setting up mapping workshops in person in three different communities, Akwasasne, Gahnawage, Ganesadage, and um, Gandege. Ganawage and Ganesadage were together because they're um, somewhat close to each other. The participants um, were of multiple ages and differing, differing speaking abilities. And the overall goal of the workshops was to teach the communities how to use the mapping system um, to input their own place names, their own stories, their own information, and also to see the value of, of mapping place names as a component of language revitalization and preservation. We used two main techniques during mapping workshops in order to document place names. The first technique was to ask community members about the place names that they already knew and used. Um, such as the name of neighborhoods like Frogtown and um, Gadarogo, and then um, streets or um, physical features that they might know, um, such as hills in the community or um, the names of certain places within a waterway. The second te technique that we used was to present maps and archival documents and then discuss the Gangeha language that appeared on them.
Um, so we started at the Native North American Traveling College in Aquasasne. Uh, that was the first community that we traveled to. And uh, Aquasasne encompasses an international border between the United States, which is down here, and two separate provinces in what's now called Canada. So Ontario is right here and Quebec is right here. And this is Aquasasne. Um, we were lucky enough that um, one of the participants in the workshop had a paper map from a 1997 GIS workshop. And that paper map, map had tons of local names on it. And some of these were in Ganyakeha and some of them were in English. Um, at the workshop, all of the names on this map were entered into the atlas. And we had a really extensive discussion about not just the meaning of the place names, but also the grammar of some of the names. Um, and in, in a couple of cases, some of the English names were just translated directly from English to Ganyangeha and just as a kind of reclamation. Um, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. I Those are reversed, my bad. <laughs> so what I'm gonna show next is a screenshot of the atlas itself, and it will give you an idea of some of the functionalities of um, the atlas. And you can go look for yourself at uh, mohawkatlas.org. So this is the zoom function as well as the pan function. The boxes that you see are clusters of points. And we're zooming in right now on um, what, what are sometimes called the Thousand Islands. And these are some of the islands that were the, with names that were entered from that map. And this uh, platform allows us to um, add multimedia such as shots of the map itself. Um, the last one that I want to show, I think I, I am there at some point come in on here. So this is an example of one of the places that was in English and that we immediately just translated it into Mohawk. So Goose Island, a goose is Gahon in Ganyakeha, and it was relatively easy to just say, well, obviously this is Gahon Kane, which is just the place, the, the place where the geese live. Uh, the second community that we traveled to is Gantege. It's also known as Tayandanega. It's a modern day Mohawk community that's located on the Bay of Quinte. And originally this was a Wendat settlement prior to 1650. It's also known as the birthplace of the peacemaker. Um, and he was a Wendat man who set out from Tayandanega and would eventually be responsible for the founding of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy um, in New York state. Today, the landscape has been altered to account for boating traffic in Lake Ontario and the Bay of Quinte and the Trent Severn Canal, which is shown on this map from 1918. In this workshop, we discussed some maps and place names that were documented by Wallace Robb um, anywhere between 1948 and 1961. And this actually added evidence to one of the initial conclusions that was made in my dissertation, that a lot of Ganyakehaga names are actually navigational names that were misunderstood when they were translated. Um, so these navigational names can only be understood coming from within a specific cultural naming convention. So this is an example here, Ojisto, which it just means star. But if you put it into the context of the North Star and the North Star being a way of guiding people, that's actually um, what it means. So Ojisto is the island that guides people down this particular waterway right there so that they know which way to go. One of the final things that we put in was actual treaty text. So this is a copy of the Simcoe deed, otherwise known as Treaty Three and a Half. Um, the Simcoe deed is actually related to um, Six Nations. And so when Six Nations was granted the land or when, was, when it was reclaimed um, through the Simcoe deed, there was a part of um, the Bay of Quinte that was also set aside specifically for Six Nations and the people at Gondege. So we were able to add the entire treaty into the atlas um, at the, the point of the map that is Gondege. Finally, we used the historical uh, map technique in Ganhawage and Ganisatage, and we used this with some place names that Cartier documented as early as 1534. Um, 
Uh, honestly, this was pretty cool for me because I, I hadn't been able to get a hold of some of these for a while. And then there were some of them that were really, really, really obvious. So in particular, Degononda um, was pretty understandable as being a kind of double hill or having two ridges. Um, and if you've ever seen a map of Montreal, you really have to look at it um, from an elevation model and in order to understand why it's called that. This is an elevation model of um, the specific point that we're talking about. And you can see how it's kind of this interesting ridge that wraps around. Yes, yeah, so today um, it's called either uh, Mont Mount Royal in English or Montreal, Montreal in French. So what I'm going to talk about is some of the uh, outcomes that we've come uh, that have come from this research. I'm going to uh, play a short video for you uh, to show you what happens when we bring community people together um, and and mapping um, as a way to revitalize the language. Now, some of the things that um, we realized was that we do need community speakers as part of the process, uh, as alongside traditional um, uh, tradi uh, old old time maps. But what this does is the speakers who may not have heard some of this language before, um, before seeing these maps and, 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 and seeing some of the, the words that they may not recognize, when we sit with them, it reinvigorates a memory um, that they have of the language itself and also of their own historical uh, relationship to the land around them. And, and it reshapes how they see things or it reinvigorates um, historical memories from family that, and stories that have been passed down through family. So what I'm gonna share with you right now is a short video that we took of uh, during one of our mapping sessions at Aguazasne uh, at the Native North American Traveling College as a way to show you um, uh, how this process takes place. So, so what happened was they're looking at one of the place names that was appeared on the large map, the paper map. And Ryan Ransom, one of our participants, called a language speaker to assist him with um, pulling apart that word and, and tying it um, so that he could tie it to the land itself, to the, the one of the islands. So because we, the other person wasn't there for the reasons, the COVID, um, to st COVID reasons, he called her on his phone and used his phone as a way and FaceTime as a way to work on this particular name. It's kind of difficult to hear, but what they're doing is they're um, taking the name, pulling it apart to try to understand each particular piece. And they're thinking about the particular land formation that it relates to and to see whether it matches or it, it makes sense also to their own knowledge of the oh, land yeah, itself yeah. and the old so place again, names. What is the place of them? Like, um, of them? Yeah. Oops. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. So just in terms of linguistics, we would just call this morphological analysis. Um, this video is available um, on the atlas itself. I believe that it's yeah. pinned to Hen Island. And you can actually search within the atlas for, for example, Hen and you should be able to find the video. Yeah, so these are the kinds of videos that we, you can append to different places. So as we work with community people on deciphering the place names, we take short videos like this and add them so that when others go into the map, other community members go into the map, they can understand, okay, how is it that this particular name, how we came up with this name or how it was translated from either the, the old historical document um, or the, the oral history onto the map itself. Oops. Okay. So 
so another interesting thing that um, um, we, we've come to uh, see with this project is that in working with community people, they, um, it, it, what we're trying to do is reinvigorate uh, understandings of place. Now, the Western system, the mapping system or the mapping tradition has been to place, can you show that door? Um, has been to um, set place names according to, uh, you know, to honor uh, people, to honor historical events. Um, they don't change those names. Um, so the, it's a very different system. It's also um, about reinforcing boundaries between places, between different sections. But through this work, uh, we've come to understand and also illustrate that a different way, how Ganyakahaga understand place itself. So one of the things that came out of um, uh, Rebecca's work during her doctoral research was that in order to understand some of the place names that she uh, put into the maps that she was working with, you had to be sitting in the water. You had to be essentially sitting in a boat on the water. And it was from that direction and from that particular um, uh, focal uh, viewpoint that you understood why that place had that name. And it was really, and, and why a place could also contain different place names because different kinds of, different people use places differently. For example, women might use a place differently than men might. And so the naming of that space or the naming of that place would have a different name according to either a male view or a female view. So that's some more of the work that we would like to do is look at how do place names, how do these places, places when we translate them or when we reinvigorate the language around them, indicate, um, you know, political functions, um, gender, gender functions, how women and men use places differently, um, how they artic how these places articulate our traditional uses um, of these spaces. And I think that's one of the things as we think forward, um, you know, we, we have, we would like to, I think it reshapes how our people, how Kanyakahaga people understand and enact sovereignty in those places. That's the real key thing here. If we think about the future implications of this kind of work is that they not only reposition one in terms of um, our understanding of, of, of our lands, but also how we, when we go for rec in reclamation of land and territories, if we are able to reinvigorate our traditional understandings of place um, and have that uh, um, reinforced through understanding the geophysical space, um, through you know, engineering engineers who might help us understand, okay, how has this place been reshaped through man? Um, you know, how do our traditional names articulate uh, our traditional uses and understanding of space? then it helps us when we uh, go to reclaim land and reclaim our territories. And so in the face of ongoing colonialism, it's, I think, communities beginning to understand. No, actually, I know community is beginning to understand the, the power of this kind of work. So um, where are we at here? Oh, the other way. The other way. So we could call this, uh, I always, I often think of, of the term that came up, which is counter mapping, but in effect, it's a digital resistance through media and making the connections between language and place. And so uh, here, it's not this one, it's two. Okay. So this really uh, came to light when we were working in Gondege, in Tindenega. Uh, we went out on the land and we talked, we were told about different places that had been reshaped. There's a specific land formation that um, is about two hills and that space in between those two hills. And it's part of the Peacemaker's Journey story. 
which is really integral to the formation, understanding the formation of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And so those particular hills have been raised. So they're actually, it's a flat place now, but the language around that space and the oral history around that space and its articulation in the peacemaker's journey and, and is really important for understanding how we use that space, how it plays an important role in marking our the, the, the very uh, core of who we are, which is, is telling that story about our formation as a confederacy of people. Here is a video of my mother um, who um, is once again, uh, I'm, she's, we took her through the process where she's a, she's a traditional language speaker, old language speaker. Um, and what, what it, what happens to her when she looks at these maps and when she thinks about the language. Saganoska. So how did you know that? But then you had to, you couldn't just read it. What did you have to do? You have to see it on the map? I have to see it. Then I saw the map. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't see the map first. I saw, I heard the name and then I figured it out. So what she's talking about is the is how the language itself um, comes alive in the mind, and because it's such a visual language, and and our language um, is all about when we talk about place and we talk about even just objects. They're not just objects. How we describe these things is 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 us in relationship to them, and so she's able to through the language understand a place in terms of a person's relationship, because the language is such a vivid thing to her. She, it, 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 it invokes um, um, what she says as uh, 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 things she can see in her mind. And so then she looks at the map and it triggers that in, in what she sees. She, she makes that connection be between what she sees in her mind and what she sees on the map. And so that's what this is um, doing for her. So um, once again, we, we were taken on our trip to Gondega, we were taken up to Lake of the Mountain, which is um, part of the, it's, it's articulated in the peacemaker's journey as well. Um, and so um, what was told to us was the story of this particular place and the language around it and how if you, if you go up there and you look at this space, it's a particular body of water that sits separately uh, from the surrounding bodies of water. It has a very uh, a unique um, microcellular structure in the water. I think that's the right word. Yeah, maybe like a, the chemical structure of the water that's is right. not connected to the, to the surrounding waterway. So it is um, considered to be completely separate from the surrounding watershed. Yeah, and so there's this part of the story in the Peacemaker's Journey describes a waterfall that um, the peacemaker jumps off of as a way to escape. And so there used to be in this particular area, there was a, a, a stream or a, a, the water would come out on the side of the mountain and it would shoot outward. And this was water from this particular body. And when we went there and we were told the story and then we looked at how it had been reshaped mm -hmm. through um, man, it really, it, we looked at it and we said, yes, this, this is actually it. This tells that place and it's been reshaped through the work of man. So it was very, very, a powerful moment. Here's some more pictures. This is what um, the, the area of uh, Picton and up here is where Lake of the two, Lake of the mountain is. So this is the body of water, but what happened was the stream would come out the side of the mountain here and it would shoot outward. And so this was what they called the, the waterfall in the story. And this is where he jumped off. Um, but what happened through man, the, the, when they cr created the town of Picton, 
when the settlers created the town of Picton, they blocked it off and they made it into a, a source of power for the mills down below. And so that has been reshaped through men. But if you look at the names and you go back and you sit with the elders and they talk about the names and the language around this place, it speaks to the original use of that space and that an understanding of that place in our stories. So once again, here's and just apologies for interrupting. Just you're out of yep. time. So if you can wrap yep. up just so we have enough sure. time for a Q and A. Yep. Thank you. And I think that's it. So just to conclude then that, um, you know, this kind of work in terms of mapping, revitalizing, of revi revitalizes language, but also revitalizes and um, reinvigorates understanding of place, not only for others, but also for Kanyakahaga and Indigenous peoples ourselves. So thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for wrapping up this panel with another fascinating talk. Uh, I'd like to um, jump right into questions. There are a lot of questions that have already been raised. So um, if you all agree, I'd like to start with um, our first speakers. So Ana Luisa Deño and uh, Gregory Anderson. And I see that um, Rebecca asked a question to the speakers of the first talk about data ownership, but it seemed that I know answered, said, answered the yeah. question. Okay, so if you don't have <laughs> any additional, okay. Uh, we'll start directly with the second question. I just wanted to acknowledge it <laughs> from the chat. And this question was raised by uh, Kira Sin. Um, she says, I also have a question about living dictionaries. You're doing the very important job of creating a platform for the preservation of indigenous languages. I was wondering if you're also planning on implementing a feature for using the created dictionaries for language learning. Yes, that's a great question from Kira. Thank you so much. We are, we're in um, talks with a few different organizations to start um, being able to use um, uh, certain dictionaries for online courses as well. So that'll be in 2022. Um, we It's something that we've wanted since the beginning <clears throat> of creating the platform. It's gone through many iterations and uh, many people have worked on it throughout through the years. We focused on um, documentation and access to the materials. And now as we grow um, as a team and as a platform, we're able to take it to the next level of curriculum building working with the right people and, and making sure that we we do this in a, in a, res, a respectful way and this uh this conference has really um it's really been so illuminating on a lot of these issues so i just want to thank all of the other speakers because i'm just like yes <laughs> so good <laughs> right and i'll just add to that that um our roadmap for development is uh, based on the fact that we have no budget for this project and it's um we piecemeal put things together uh, as we have, and we're a very small team. And, and so a lot of the desires uh, sort of roll out on a longer time frame than we wish was possible. But, um, you know, we're, we're going to, you know, try to secure better funding for this so that we can, you know, realize more of these goals in a more reasonable time frame. And just to add to that, a lot of um, a lot of the features and tools that you see on the Living Dictionaries platform, um, we've been able to um, to harness the power of some of this digital technology because it it has become a lot more affordable now. Like digital storage um, in the cloud is so much more affordable than it was ten years ago. Um, so that's really good. Also, um, we're working with YouTube API to have um, video recording directly in the platform. And so as Rebecca posed that question, that will not entail that they own that data. It would just allow them, it allows us to use their tool for free. So we went through many bureaucratic hoops to get that for free. And the, the Algolia search functionality, also we applied as like a nonprofit to be able to get that search. It's usually a very expensive search functionality, but we were able to get it for free by making the case that, hey, this is really serving humanity's heritage on a larger level. I had kind of wondered. And we don't if, own any of the data anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah we don't own the data. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. I had, yeah, yeah. I had kind <laughs> of wondered curious. if that had been the, the case or not. But I know, you know, we at the GCRC, we often have that conversation about um, about data ownership. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the reasons that OCAP is part of, of our work. So, I mean, I think it, it's, it is part of a wider conversation. So, it, you know, whenever I see somebody talking about, that kind of platform, I'm always kind of like, how did they solve this problem? So I, yeah, I appreciate just the discussion. Begging, crying. 
<laughs> I'm impressed. It takes a lot to convince Google. So, I mean, it's, it's, that's some darn good work right there. You, you've set a good precedent. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I would add that... I would add that the video functionality is not yet complete. So we're still our, our two web developers and some of our interns have worked on that. And it's a, it's a more complicated piece, but it's one of the most requested things when we do webinars, people are like, okay, so when can I get video on the platform, you know, to show dialogues between speakers, to show, you know, elders and uh, pronouncing the words and phrases. So we've really tried to prioritize it on our shoestring budget. So it should be coming out in the, the coming months. Uh, and we're also, the export feature, we're very proud of it. We're about to roll that out tomorrow, actually, because because the communities own the data, all, all the metadata, the images, the audio files, and soon videos. That's all community owned, as Greg said. Um, so now they'll uh, be able to have an export button just for dictionary managers and their collaborators. They'll be able to then export anything that they've put onto the platform. Yeah. It will be very useful. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca, I'm, and, and uh, both of you, I'm just such a big fan of the Atlas. I was just nerding out so much for, on the Atlas of Kanyankeha space. So, I mean, just congratulations. We're, we're happy to hear that. That's I'm, I'm nerding out of your platform over here. So it's a <laughs> two-way nerd out. This is great. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'd like to continue just to have at least a question for, for every speaker. Um, so I didn't see a, um, a question in the chat, so I'm going to um, jump in and ask a question myself for the speakers of the second talk, um, although I had a few, but I, what was really pressing is actually, um, I'm really fascinated by this issue of re relationality, and um, in your research, I understand it's ongoing, and um, you've only just begun the analysis of online courses, but do you have an idea of what might constitute be best practice in terms of integrating relationality in ILR courses? That's a great question. Um, so I didn't really get to talk about this in the presentation itself, but my own personal interest in this topic came because um, Chickasaw Nation had, I mean, it's still ongoing, a partnership with Rosetta Stone to create Rosetta Stone Chickasaw. And if you're familiar, like if you've ever done a course like this on Rosetta Stone or Duolingo, you probably have seen that it's usually like for tourists or like business people who are trying to leave the place where they're and go somewhere else. Whereas our purpose was really, we're trying to help people connect more deeply to where they are, where they come from. And there was no model for that. And so we kind of just stumbled through it. Um, it has, so Rosetta Stone Chickasaw has um, four levels with 160 lessons. So we now have a lot of experience at this. So, and, and um, you've worked on the development of, yes. oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So we really shifted towards, you know, away from like the original model that Rosetta Stone gave us for their scope and sequence and curriculum development to really just like grounding it in Chickasaw epistemologies. Um, we centered a Chickasaw family. Um, everything takes place in the nation. We use custom images. We have audio from community members. So um, these are sort of practices that we kind of came to through our own work. Oh, that's really encouraging. I want to, I want to see it now. It's great that they sought um, your advice and input and in the creation of that curriculum. So that's, that's really heartening. I'm <laughs> really relieved to hear that. Thank you, thank you for that. We have um, two questions in the chat for the third speakers. Um, so the first is from uh, Sarah Canalella. Um, so I couldn't help but notice, she says, that Circassian linguistic oppression actively started in 1923 after the creation of the state of Turkey from the ashes of the Ottoman Empire. How much did the Western concept of state as united by one language, one religion, and one history influenced the marginalization of linguistic minorities? Yeah, um, so that's a great question. Actually, um, in 1923, the Repub Turkish Republic was established, um, um, as, as Sarah mentioned, from the ashes of Ottoman Empire. So during the Ottoman Empire, as Hamid uh, mentioned, Circassians were able to publish their own newspaper, bilingual newspaper in Circassian and Ottoman Turkish. They were able to open two schools. Uh, where the medium of instruction was in Circassian. But right when the Republic was um, 
um, declared they shut down all these schools. They actually even arrested the teachers, Circassian teachers, collected all the books that they created and burned down all those books. So right away after the Republic was declared, the nation state ideologies were so like, uh, like pervasive, like everywhere for not just for Circassian, but for other minority languages. Turkey has uh, over 40 different minority languages, but this Turkification, uh, so they would call what the state would do as, so Tur the biggest minority in Turkey is Kurds, Kurdish uh, speakers. So they would call them, since they're from the Eastern part of Turkey, they would call them mountain Turks, right? They would Turkify them, they're not Turkish at all. And for Circassians, since we're from the North Caucasus, they would call us Caucasus Turks. So they uh, they put this uh, you know uh, uh, rhetoric out there that in, you know everyone was Turkish. You know doesn't matter. You're from the Caucasus. You can you might be speaking like a totally different language, but you're you're Turkish. So that was really uh, um, evident everywhere in education, and you know uh, all languages was all languages were like banned in schools, uh, even in Circassian villages. Um, people were not able to really speak their uh, native language. The teachers would physically punish them. Uh, my parents, both my mom and dad, they, they went to schools uh, in a Circassian village. Um, they, they could not speak their um, uh, language in school. So right after the Republic was declared, um, um, Sarah, the nation state ideologies, the assimilationist policies, they were, uh, um, they were really uh, effective, unfortunately. I'll ask the second question. There's um, Valeria Minakova um, thanked you for your talk. I'll just get to the question. Was the course advertised as a course for heritage Circassian speakers or was it open to anyone regardless of their ethnic self-identification? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Lara, for the question. This course was not advertised just uh, for heritage language speakers. Um, Hamid was actually one of the um, uh, instructors uh, and we had, he had 15 uh, non-Circassian uh, participants. I actually got to interview one participant. He was uh, from Minnesota. He joined the courses for almost a year from Minnesota. He was American. Uh, he did not have any heritage uh, uh, connection to this uh, language, but it wasn't advertised as just a heritage language. Anybody uh, could uh, participate in the classes. And I know Hamid, during the courses, he was actually in Turkey. He, he would... Uh, you would have this flexible schedule for the participants joining from, you know, other countries uh, for non-Circassian participants to accommodate their, um, their needs too. So yeah, it was open to everybody. It'd be interesting to see how the difference, the um, individuals who come from other ethnic backgrounds, how their uh, motivations were different than others. Um, Mm -hmm. Okay, well, again, I, I had a few questions. I won't take time yeah. away from, the, <laughs> from other participants who have, yeah. who have questions, but really uh, very fascinating. Mm -hmm. Thanks. May, um, may I ask a question thanks. to Rebecca and Kahinta, please? Absolutely, Anna. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, first of all, I just wanted to congratulate everybody because this was a great panel. Honestly, I have lots of notes here. Um, um, so I appreciated each and every um, talk. Uh, and I think it was very important to have a panel on language revitalization and uh, digital technologies because it's part of resistant practices across indigenous communities. Um, no, it was just uh, out of curiosity, um, Kahente and Rebecca, uh, because um, I remember reading um, a book years ago, um, and I myself did some investigation into place names, indigenous place names, uh, from, a, in a from a linguistic point of view, in a discursive perspective as uh, resistance strategies. Um, um, I remember this, this book saying, um, there was, it was about a story of uh, an, an indigenous person uh, talking to uh, a white person um, saying, uh, if this is your land, uh, then where are your stories? stories. Where are your stories? Uh, <laughs> yep, I have that and, book too. Okay, great. I don't remember the name. I don't remember the name of the, the of the book or the author. Uh, maybe you'll tell me later. Um, but anyway, my 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 question is: uh, Have you thought of including uh, somewhere, or if maybe it's a stupid question, have you thought of including in your atlas like pieces of stories 
um, mm, yeah. connected to place names because actually, I, I feel like it's mm. it's it's an important. It, it would add more to your work. Actually, the the way that the map works is that you can include video, you can include okay. written text in PDF, you can in include pictures. So we actually are including stories in okay. the map. Okay. Yes, right. one yeah. of the stories that's already in there right now. There's there are actually maybe three or four of them. Mm -hmm. So one of them has to do with a neighborhood in Gahnawage that's called Clay Mountain. And yeah. it didn't exist before the seaway went through, which was, I believe, in 1955. 59. Oh, 59. Sorry. See, this is, yeah. Anyway, um, so, you know, that story, there's a feel that we have that's specifically for stories where people just want to write their own story. Yeah. And so that is in there. Um, one of the other things that's in there is some people have chosen to um, put in stories about their own families. Mm -hmm. So um, Toha Honde, who is my husband, um, he was separated from um, essentially his culture for quite a long time. And part mm -hmm. of his reclamation of his heritage has been to document his own family um, and what he remembers about um, visiting Gahtege and his cousins and his uncle. Um, mm -hmm. So he has family pictures um, yeah. that are connected to, for example, his uncle's house, um, or there's um, a community that's right next to Gahtege that's um, yeah. that quite a, f a few people live in as well. And, and so he's chosen to mark those locations. So this also then speaks to not only reclamation of land and territories, but also reclamation of identity. Yep. Right. So yeah, this is just the first iteration. And that's one of the things that, that continued to come up as we were working was that people would begin to speak about um, kind of the same topic and yeah. the different ways that it, it had affected either them or the community in general. Yeah. And so this um, Atlas is, is a, it's a platform for a bunch of different things. So it's not just yeah. attempting yeah. to connect the language and the culture and the landscape together again, because that's a big, a big part of it. But the mm -hmm. other part of it is um, as a kind of conduit yeah. for a history of that landscape yes and and to work through the stories that are most important to those communities mm -hmm. um using that platform mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you very much so fascinating and so important and powerful yes so anna i don't want to um i know that we are out of time i don't know if i um I see that there is one more question in Let's the take chat. Just, Perhaps we can yeah. just very briefly address yes. it and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Yes. Um, yes. Because this question is from Marcela in the chat for um, Carrie Chu and her team. Um, how do you assess, measure this relationality? Uh, there's a longer message. Um, through these observations, or do you plan to do this during the gathering with the communities? I'm sorry, perhaps I have to give some. So your research looks into relationality between communities and digital technologies. And in this first stage of your research, you have been looking into different platforms for indigenous languages, how they work, what they ask of users. And now I'll repeat the questions. How do you assess measure this relationality through these observations or do you plan to do this during the gathering with the communities? That's a great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so one thing that we're being really conscious of is that our research is not evaluative um, of particular platforms or of the work that communities are doing um, to make their courses. And so what we've done in this initial stage is we've developed a template um, so that when we look at a course, we um, can kind of uh, position ourselves in relationship to that course. So we have, you know, a spot for the researcher to explain their relationship to that language, um, and then to look through and say, um, for example, like, does this course include images? And if so, what are those images like? Is it stock photos? Um, are there images from communities? Is it a mixture? Like how did communities sort of navigate when a course just has a spot where you can upload images? How did they decide to work with that, that place in the course? Thank you very much everyone for this fascinating panel. I really am even more honored now that I've lived it that to have played this role here. It was absolutely fascinating um, discussions and um, talks. 
So thank you very much to you all and to Anna for uh, including me in um, this fascinating program. And I thank you, I leave the floor to you this time, Anna. Thank you, thank you, Jackie. Thank you very much for being a wonderful chair. Thank you to all our speakers for uh, bringing in such important issues about language and, and resistance. So now we got to the end of uh, day two. Uh, more to come on day, tw on day three. Uh, so tomorrow we'll uh, start at 2.30 p.m. Rome time with uh, Alexandra Gogakopoulou's um, keynote address on uh, storytelling between platform design and user resistance. So I hope you will join us tomorrow. Uh, thank you for being here today and uh, good evening. Here it's uh, almost 7 p.m. Uh, so goodbye everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much. Ciao. Thanks, everybody. Ona. Ciao. Ona. Ciao. 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 Ci